For many Spider-Man fans all around the world, February 2015 was a very memorable time. The announcement is finally made public. Sony Pictures Entertainment brings Marvel Studios into the amazing world of Spider-Man. The internet celebrates a bittersweet victory, the start of a hopeful new era for Spider-Man, albeit without Andrew Garfield. June 2015, Tom Holland is announced as the brand new Peter Parker, making his debut in Captain America Civil War. And so the wait begins. What's in store for this new Spider-Man? How will he live up to Andrew Garfield and Tobey Maguire? And, oh god, how will the suit look? Can anything compare to the greatness we've already witnessed from the Raimi trilogy and the amazing Spider-Man 2's incredibly faithful threads? Speculation was rampant. Fans were claiming they'd caught a glimpse at the Spider-Man suit shooting for Civil War and that we were in for something very different. Images and sketches were shared of what the suit would look like. <laughs> The first trailer for Captain America Civil War dropped without any appearance of Spider-Man at all. The film looms nearer and nearer until March 10th, just a little under two months ahead of the film's release, trailer 2 drops. And at the very end of the trailer, he appears. Spider-Man, with Captain America's iconic shield in hand and two little words from a youthful voice. Hey everyone. And with that, Spider-Man is welcomed to the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Well, hey, wait a minute, it's me, Bob, from, from Bob's Burgers. Why don't you sit down? A YouTube video is a lot like a burger. It takes a bit of effort to grill it and put it together. But the thing is, while you may pay me for a burger, you can watch these videos for free. So all I ask is that you subscribe to the channel. Maybe hit the like button as well, Gene. And if you do want to pay for the video like you would pay for a burger, the link to the patron is in the description below. Enjoy the rest of the video, Linda. So why exactly did fans want Spider-Man in the MCU so badly anyway? Well, there is a curiosity factor. We'd never seen Spider-Man alongside other Marvel superheroes on the big screen before. But it wasn't just about crossovers. Marvel Studios was, at that time, one of the most reliable studios for a quality blockbuster proving that they could do a great job managing a variety of different types of superhero from street level to cosmic. Marvel's track record might not have been perfect at this time, but it was certainly more compelling than Sony's. I couldn't think of a better shot to lead with for a first impression with MCU Spidey than what we got at the end of trailer 2. First of all, there's a clear look at the costume, and we can rest easy, it's classic Spidey. This time, ditching the raised webbing and frills of the previous Hollywood Spidey suits in favor of something flatter and cleaner, with the only departure being black stripes cutting through some of the red sections. But not only was he rocking up in a gorgeously faithful rendition of the suit, his eyes have apertures that can squint, showing that this Spidey was drawing some more inspiration from the source material, complete with emotive eyes. He was also rocking up in a nice classic Spidey pose as he cheekily snatches Captain America's shield and poses with it. This was Spider-Man diving into the scene, yoinking one of the most iconic pieces of Marvel iconography and posing with it, sending Marvel and Spider-Man fans alike into a frenzy. For this new Spider-Man, things were a bit different. He wasn't being introduced in his very own solo movie, but as a supporting cast member in the third film in the Captain America franchise, and at a pivotal point for the MCU, as it was entering its third phase and fracturing its Avengers team. Not only that, this Spider-Man would be skipping the origin story altogether, giving us a pre-established, albeit younger Spider-Man, with Tom Holland being the youngest actor in the role to date. As mentioned in the Spidey Summit before, this Spider-Man was going back to high school and he'd be staying there for more than just one movie. So, how did Captain America Civil War do with laying down the groundwork for the Spider-Man of a new generation? It begins with Tony Stark recognizing that his team in the Civil War is a little short with Hulk and Thor off the grid. So he goes to visit a person of interest. The big Civil War location text shows Queens, as we follow Peter Parker returning home from school with a DVD player. But when he gets in, he's met not only by Aunt May, as played by Marissa Tomei, but Tony Stark, as both Peter and Tony knowingly bluff to each other about the Stark Foundation grant. 
Tony asks for a moment to speak to Peter alone and the two talk. Tony revealing to Peter that he's been watching him, that he knows that he's Spider-Man. Peter tries everything he can to hide it, but Tony being a few steps ahead finds the suit. This scene tells us everything we need to know about Peter. He's clever, he's nailed his algebra test, Tony is impressed with the webbing Peter's developed all by himself. He's also a dumpster diver, he's got an antiquated computer, his DVD player came from a dumpster, he's resourceful. He doesn't use his powers for leisure, believing that he needs to stay true to himself and his original abilities when in public to keep his secret. And his motivation? Responsibility. That given his abilities, if he doesn't act when bad things happen, they are his responsibility. Tom Holland's performance also does a lot to sell that this motivation comes from a place of hurt, as he stutters shortly before revealing his MO to Tony. But it also needs to be said that in this one scene, Tom Holland completely wins me over with his performance as Peter Parker. He comes off as mild-mannered, secretive, a bit awkward, and absolutely sells the boy genius angle. Tony tells him that he needs an upgrade and recruits him for the battle against Captain America and uses Aunt May and his secret identity as leverage against him. Peter is 15 in this film, and there's something pretty ugly about Tony dragging a kid who has minimal understanding of the Sokovia Accords into the battle with Captain America. But what's cool about Peter's role in all this is, again, he has nothing to do with this film's internal conflict. Every reason he has to battle Captain America is told to him by Iron Man. This film represents a dark place for Iron Man. In Civil War, everyone has their own emotional stake in the battle, their own personal conflicts, except for Spider-Man. He has nothing to do with it. Which means while, yes, he is fighting in the fight, He's also pretty friendly and jovial with the people he's fighting against, which means we get a lot of quips and even some friendlier interactions between him and Cap, despite them being on opposing sides. What I especially love about this scene though is that Spider-Man's full might is on display here, as he makes quick work of both the Falcon and the Winter Soldier. The Winter Soldier has shown to be, over the course of the first half of Civil War and Captain America the Winter Soldier, a force to be reckoned with. His arm virtually unstoppable yet Spider-Man is able to catch his punch and make a joke back to him. Spidey's always a few steps ahead and he's able to use his brains to take down Giant Man. While he has nothing to do with the overall conflict, this scene belongs to Spidey. He steals the show and he makes his debut holding his own against some of the MCU's most powerful heroes. We then see Spider-Man again in the after credits as he discovers the spider signal in his web shooters, hinting at more never before seen on screen classic Spidey features coming in the near future before the text reads, Spider-Man will return. Goosebumps. What an incredible debut for the MCU Spider-Man. Captain America Civil War remains one of the strongest MCU entries to date, bringing the MCU two new incredible heroes in Black Panther and Spider-Man, both of which made lasting impressions. Spider-Man gets around 20 minutes of screen time in this film, and every moment of that is spent establishing this new Spider-Man. From the power and jovial nature of the Spider-Man persona, to Peter and the weight on his shoulders. Nothing of the origin story is explicitly stated. There's no outright mentions of the spider that bit him or Uncle Ben. It's more or less left to our imagination there. But what we do know is who Spider-Man is and what he's all about six months into his vigilante career. Then in 2017, we get the very first Sony and Marvel collaboration with Spider-Man Homecoming. And it's clear that Sony are making the most of the new toys they have to play with, thanks to Spider-Man's place in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Front and center in the marketing of Spider-Man Homecoming was that Spider-Man would be teaming up with Iron Man for this one. Seriously, you are hard pressed to find a poster for this film that doesn't feature Iron Man. He was all over the marketing for this film. If Raimi's Spider-Man trilogy represents the Ditko and Romita eras of Spider-Man, and Mark Webb's Amazing Spider-Man movies represent the ultimate Spider-Man, then the first MCU Spider-Man film was being marketed as a Marvel team-up. Looking at the marketing of the previous Spider-Man movies, we had Going for the Ultimate Spin with Spider-Man 1, Choice and Destiny for Spider-Man 2, an internal struggle with Spider-Man 3, an untold story with The Amazing Spider-Man, and the ultimate battle with a barrage of enemies for The Amazing Spider-Man 2. Yet at the center of Spider-Man Homecoming's marketing was, this one is in the MCU. 
which I guess I get for brand recognition, but for Spider-Man's first standalone movie in the MCU, a fully blown team up with Iron Man wasn't really what I'd hoped would be on the cards. The marketing for this film, in spite of a very strong first trailer, was just, hey look, remember the MCU stuff? Avengers Tower, Iron Man. Fortunately, that wasn't the case though, as what we got was a Spider-Man movie that basically had some expanded cameos from Iron Man. And as a Spider-Man movie, Spider-Man Homecoming was perhaps the best reboot we could have asked for for this time. This film lightens the load significantly. Both the Sam Raimi and Mark Webb series tied their stories, even their sequels, closely with Spider-Man's origins. They were very introspective films. And there's definitely a place for that. As I say, I love the Raimi trilogy. I love the first Amazing Spider-Man. These are quintessentially Spidey stories, but there have been hundreds of Spider-Man stories throughout the ages, with not all of them hinging on Peter's origins. Not all of them featuring callbacks to Peter's past. Spider-Man Homecoming is all about looking to a bright future for a new hero. Like the previous two Peters, Tom Holland's Peter has wants and goals. Toby's Peter wanted to be with Mary Jane Watson, Andrew's Peter wanted to understand the grief of his parents abandoning him, and this Peter wants to score a date with Liz Allen. However, a major difference this time is that Spider-Man also gets a long-term goal. And much of the dichotomy between Peter and Spider-Man comes in the conflicts of those goals. Spider-Man wants to be an Avenger. Like The Amazing Spider-Man though, there's a distinct difference between what Peter wants and what he needs. His desires at the start of the film compared to his desires at the end of the film. Peter has also been completely reinvented. He's not a friendless loner or a guy with the baggage of a best friend who low-key despises him. He's surrounded by a small group of students who would all be happy to have him as a part of the academic triathlon team, while he's ultimately still a bit of an awkward goof. He has struggles socializing, but they're kind of just all on him this time. We've got a new MJ too, but she's not Mary Jane. She's Michelle Jones, a smart, snarky loner with a dark sense of humor, as played by Zendaya. But she's not Peter's love interest in this film, as he hasn't really gotten much of a chance to get to know her yet. This Peter, as of this film, has a sense of puppy love for the smart, vibrant Liz Allen, played by Laura Harrier. While this film is in the high school setting, you don't really have the bullies and the jocks like you'd see in Spider-Man 1 and The Amazing Spider-Man. This Peter attends more of a science-specific school and is surrounded by his fellow geeks, including his best friend Ned Leeds, played by Jacob Batalon. We've also got to talk about Flash Thompson, played by Tony Revolori. As I said, no bullies, no jocks. Flash Thompson is an obnoxious wealthy kid. He's the guy to host the parties and he views Peter as an easy target for pranks and remarks. A justification for this was that he's a bit more relevant to the youth culture of today. I honestly appreciate that this version of Flash is more of a rival to Peter, someone who is almost as smart as Peter but overcompensates with money and just being outright obnoxious. And yeah, that's quite a far cry from classic Flash, but the supporting cast of this film are a total reinvention through and through, even down to Aunt May played by Marissa Tomei, lesser doting old aunt, more of a mother to Peter. Now I'll be real, I can understand why these changes may be alienating, but to me, different doesn't have to mean bad. Again, it's a total reinvention, but it all feels very much in the spirit of a young Spider-Man story but absolutely makes sense for the story they're trying to tell here. It's very much a modernization of the early Spider-Man run, taking influence from the Ultimate comics, particularly when Miles Morales came into play, as Ned Leeds very closely mirrors Miles' best friend Ganky Lee. Ned finds out very early into the film that Peter is Spider-Man, and the audience can relate in that this is one of the most exciting things that has ever happened to Ned. But, like with Peter and Gwen in the Amazing Spider-Man films, Peter and Ned are really a team here, as Ned acts as Peter's guy in the chair, except this time, the love interest remains divorced from Peter's life as Spider-Man, as Liz Allen has no knowledge of his secret. Now, that's going to be important to the Peter Parker-Spider-Man conflict, but a bit more on that later. What's so great about Spider-Man Homecoming in the context of the bigger picture of the MCU is that we actually get to see the ordinary people that inhabit the world of the MCU, which is something we rarely see. 
You got Iron Man, he's a billionaire. Captain America, he's a war veteran from the past, a super soldier. These aren't really people who live in the real world as such. They don't live normal lives the way Peter Parker does. So when New York is under fire with Spider-Man Homecoming, we actually get to know some of the people that inhabit that city. A departure from the previous Spider-Man films is that those previous films tend to focus more on Peter Parker, which is to be expected when their stories stay closer to the origins of the character, while Spider-Man Homecoming is much more focused on Spider-Man. A criticism that I had of Amazing Spider-Man 2 was that Peter didn't spend enough of the film in costume as Spider-Man. The film felt very distracted from the hero that we all bought tickets to see. Spider-Man Homecoming completely fixes this and then some, as this is probably the most Spidey-centric live-action film to date. There's a lot less reluctance from Peter towards being Spider-Man in Spider-Man Homecoming. This Spider-Man is always seeking to act, he's always ready to suit up and save the day, but he's under the surveillance of Tony Stark and Happy Hogan. There are other authorities he has to answer to this time and certain operations he's ready to suit up for are already covered by people who are paid to deal with it. It's quite meta in the sense that Spider-Man has never existed in a universe like this before, and now he kinda needs to adapt. It's another major factor at play here, it's the backdrop of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. We've never had a Spider-Man share superhero status before. He's always been the one and only superhero that we know of in his universe. So it calls the question, in a universe full of superheroes, what kind of superhero is Spider-Man? And that's something Peter has to learn over the course of the film. Something previous Peters haven't really even had to consider. Picking up after the events of Captain America Civil War, Tony allows Peter to keep the newly teched out Spider-Man costume that he used in Germany. And Peter is just constantly waiting for the next mission, the next phone call. While in the meantime, he looks for things to do as Spider-Man in Queens. Like a kid entering their dream job though, it quickly becomes clear that operating under Tony Stark isn't really all that, as he spends most of his time, again, waiting for phone calls. And then when he pursues his own missions, he gets told by Iron Man himself that he should have just stayed put. Peter longs for a sense of independence as he rebels against Iron Man and constantly takes matters into his own hands, only to be scolded for it by one of his idols. So the dynamic between Spider-Man and Iron Man is often a bone of contention among Spider-Man fans. Personally, I don't really have any issue with it. Peter doesn't exactly do as he's told often acting against Iron Man's wishes. It's a big component in this film. Iron Man constantly underestimates Peter, viewing him as just someone to help old ladies cross the street, telling him Captain America could have easily laid him out if he wanted to, calling the FBI on him when he went to take down the criminals on the Staten Island Ferry. Peter also underestimates himself though, as he begins to rely on the technical functions of his new suit instead of his intuitions. So. Let me back up a bit. Spider-Man foils a bank robbery and notices that the robbers have incredibly unique advanced technology. So he investigates. He wants to go to Flash Thompson's party and make an impression alongside Ned. Peter claims he's friends with Spider-Man and Flash pressures Peter into bringing Spider-Man to the party. So Peter suits up and just as he's ready to go and claim peak social status, he witnesses an explosion in the distance and gives chase, only to stumble his way into an alien weaponry deal. So let's quickly talk about the villains of this film. Adrian Toomes, played by Michael Keaton, runs a cleanup operation and after the events of the Avengers, he and his team are ready to clean up the damage left by the Chitauri invasion attempt, but they're run out of business by Tony Stark's damage control organization. So they become criminal scavengers, taking what they can from the aftermath of devastating events in the MCU to sell them as weapons. Adrian Toomes creates flight gear for himself and becomes the Vulture. Montana, this time, isn't a member of the Enforcers, but is instead the first incarnation of the Shocker, alongside Herman Schultz, who would succeed him after his death. And there's also the Tinkerer, who combines the alien tech with human tech to create the weapons. Two of their clients are Aaron Davis and Matt Gargan, who are yet to become the Prowler and Scorpion respectively, but... Well, wait a minute. How many villains does that total if we include villains that aren't quite villains yet? That's six Spider-Man villain characters being adapted here. Sinister Six much? Whoa! Nah, but the film's main villain is really Vulture. He's the head of the entire operation. 
Now, after being rescued from the clutches of the Vulture, Iron Man tells Spider-Man not to interfere and that this will be dealt with, just not by him. Spider-Man finds a leftover piece of alien weaponry after the chase and decides to study it at school with Ned. However, it sets off a pulse which leads the two shockers to Midtown High. Peter places a tracker on them and investigates their operation and how he can shut it down, and so he does everything in his power to do so. He has Ned hack his new Spider-Man tech suit to remove the restrictions, and he sets out to Washington DC with his class for the academic triathlon, but that's not what Peter is there for. He's there to take the weapons dealers down at their lair in Maryland. Ned brings the weaponry component with him for safekeeping and investigation. After a scuffle with Vulture, Spider-Man finds himself trapped in the damage control vault, unable to get back to his friends. Back in Washington DC, his friends win the academic triathlon without him. Peter misses out on his class's victory and a visit to the Washington Monument. However, the bag scanner at the monument sets off the explosive capabilities of the weapon component in Ned's bag, putting his class in mortal danger. Spider-Man escapes just on time and rescues his classmates, but Peter is in trouble for ditching them and gets detention. See, that's what it's all about. Spider-Man, he gets punished for doing the right thing. That's just, that's a very Spider-Man thing. Spidey sets out to interrogate Aaron Davis, completely botches the interrogation, but Aaron tells him there's an operation going on on the Staten Island Ferry. So Spider-Man swings out to stop Vulture on the ferry. He takes his weapon, webs it to the boat, causing the weapon to overload, splitting the boat in half. Spidey does everything he can to keep it together until Iron Man steps in to put the boat back together successfully. Tony determines that Spider-Man is more of a liability than an asset and withdraws his support, including the suit. Trying to make the best of a bad situation, Peter asks Liz Allen to the homecoming dance and she says yes, but when he goes to pick her up, we're met with a shocking revelation. She's the Vulture's daughter. Peter accidentally kills the Vulture in front of her, and she becomes the Vulture seeking revenge. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Toombs gives both Peter and Liz a ride to the dance. Toombs notices that Peter seems familiar, but when Liz jokes about how Peter always disappears, how he disappeared at the party, how he disappeared in DC, Toombs starts to put it all together in an incredibly tense and well-directed scene. Toombs discovers that Peter is Spider-Man. He tells Liz he wants to speak with Peter alone, and he threatens him. He tells him he's willing to let everything slide because he saved his daughter, but if he ever interferes with his business again, he'll kill Peter and everyone he loves. He then sends Peter in to the dance. Peter goes to Liz, apologizes to her, and then runs off. He grabs his old suit and webs from beneath his locker and sets out, only to be intercepted by Herman Schultz, the Shocker before he can even put his web shooters on. The two fight in the school bus parking lot until Peter is rescued by Ned using Peter's drop web shooter to web Shocker to the side of a bus. It's a really cool scene as well because we're seeing Shocker like using his gloves to push buses onto Peter. And I love just little details like Spider-Man getting distracted by the gum on the bottom of the seats. Just a great character moment for Spidey. So Ned goes back to the school library to help Peter track down the Vulture, whose next target is the Stark Jet moving resources from the old Avengers Tower to the new base upstate. Spidey borrows Flash Thompson's car to chase after the Vulture. Vulture uses his wings to collapse an entire building onto Spidey and sets out for the jet, but Spidey manages to motivate himself to lift the ruins of the building off of him before webbing onto the Vulture's wings, following him onto the Stark jet. Also, when Ned Leeds is asked why he's not at the dance, he has the funniest excuse. He tells the teacher he's looking at porn, and I cannot think of a funnier answer than that. Just well played, Ned Leeds. Good on you, man. Peter and the Vulture battle in the sky as the Stark jet crashes into Coney Island. Peter tries to tell the Vulture that his wing pack is about to explode, but the Vulture ignores it and is defeated. Spidey webs him up, leaves a note for Happy and the police to find him, and the Vulture is defeated. When Peter goes back to school, Liz Allen reveals that she's moving to Oregon, her dad is going to prison, and she clearly resents Peter for standing her up. Tony then admits to Peter that he was wrong to underestimate him, and offers him a position as an Avenger, complete with his very own Iron Spider suit, but Peter declines, preferring to stay within his lane as a friendly neighborhood Spider-Man, operating completely independently. He goes home to find he's been gifted his Stark suit back, minus some of the bells and whistles, and he suits up. 
only to be caught by Aunt May. And the film ends on the cliffhanger as Aunt May now knows that Peter is Spider-Man. In the mid-credits, we see Toomes in prison alongside Matt Gargan, who asks him if he knows who Spider-Man is. Toomes honors Peter's secret. So that's Spider-Man Homecoming, and there's just so much going for it. For starters, it's an incredibly fresh new direction for the franchise. Free from the baggage of the Spider-Man origin story, there's a lot less drama this time around, but that doesn't mean it's not there at all. When Peter disappears to be Spider-Man, it usually comes with consequences for himself and his friends, be it Ned accidentally bringing a bomb onto the Washington Monument, or him getting detention for failing to attend the triathlon, or missing his shot with Liz Allen, or Aunt May worrying about him disappearing all the time. There's also a great moment where Liz and the gang are all gonna go swimming, but Peter has to go out and be Spider-Man, and there's a moment of him just contemplating. You know that he wishes he were a normal guy so he could just go swimming with those guys, but no, he's, he's got a mission to go on. Yes, this is a very self-motivated Spidey, but it's also a very conflicted one too, in a very subtle way. The consequences of being Spider-Man are a little smaller than they were in previous Spider-Man films though, but they're the kind of consequences that fit a story emphasizing a younger Spider-Man. He's the kid superhero of the MCU, so when he misses school obligations to be Spider-Man rather than death and destruction, the consequences are more just a month's detention, and I'm completely okay with that. Another contributing factor to this film being as refreshing as it is, is that it feels more like a genre movie. It's a John Hughes adjacent Spider-Man comedy. The high school stuff is all very quirky and comedic and his classmates are given more focus than ever before, but that bleeds into the action too. Now, okay, if you're used to the action of the previous films, what we have here is a step down for definite. Spider-Man Homecoming does not pride itself on its action in spite of being much more Spidey-centric. It's the smallest scale Spidey film to date. There aren't many majorly kinetic battles, nor is there any devoted web swinging scene either. Because Spider-Man doesn't actually go to Manhattan in this one. He doesn't go to the big city. He sticks mostly to Queens and spends a little time in Washington DC. Which means we get things like Spider-Man not swinging into the final battle. He instead drives there in Flash's car, which he doesn't know how to drive. He confronts his fear of heights for the first time atop the Washington Monument. The first major action sequence is all in a closed bank, but I think a great scene that really summarizes what this movie's all about is the scene of him chasing down the Shockers through Queens in their van. He tries to shoot a web in a football pitch, but there's nothing to swing from. So we get this action sequence of him just charging through residential areas, knocking down fences, falling into backyards, etc. This film keeps it smaller, and even just makes a joke about how impractical these residential areas are for someone with Spidey's abilities. Because of this, this film does not rely on the web swinging for thrills. We get other inventive ways to showcase Peter's powers, such as him walking on his own web tightrope in the opening montage, and testing all the different functions of the new suit in the damage control locker. So this new tech suit, it, it might sound very Iron Man, but it's really a means of showcasing some of Spidey's wackier abilities from the comics without too many questions about practicality. The different ways he can shoot webs with these new augmented web shooters, taser webs, web grenades, and my favorite function of all, the web wings, which serve a gliding function and are inspired by the earliest years of Spidey. This film is full of Easter eggs to Spidey's past, including the different functions of his new suit, but also you got Aaron Davis mentioning that he has a nephew, hinting at a potential Miles Morales in the future of the MCU. There's a scene where Spidey lifts the building off of himself, referencing the if this be my destiny moment from the Ditko era. The reflection of his face and his mask in the puddle, paying homage to the classic Spidey sense imagery. Spider-Man Homecoming, may represent quite a major departure from the source material in terms of things like characterization, but it's full of visual references for longtime fans to appreciate. There are also tons of nods to the MCU as well, as Sony are clearly having a lot of fun with the MCU toy box. Not only does Iron Man appear, but so does Captain America in a series of school PSA videos, including one of the funniest after credits in the MCU, a PSA about unrewarded patience from Captain America. That's genius, and the groans in the audience were just perfect. 
Spider-Man Homecoming, yeah, it is a far cry from the source material in various aspects. Peter Parker is a far more socially adjusted person than he's usually portrayed as in his teen years. He's not rife with emotional baggage, he's a normal kid. He has his friends, he has his frustrations, he has his idols. Tony Stark being an idol to Peter also makes a lot of sense. Peter is a technical whiz and a would-be superhero, and Iron Man does serve as a form of authority in the MCU. Iron Man is someone that Peter Parker would naturally idolize in this universe. But it all feeds into the film's main theme, which is underestimation. Tony Stark underestimates Peter when he tells him not to act, when he tells him to just rescue kittens from trees and stay close to the ground. Peter underestimates himself when he relies too much on his suit and loses track of his true power. Toombs underestimates Peter when he tells him to stay out of his way. Peter, Toombs, and Ned all underestimate the power of the tech and weapons that they're dealing with. Toombs underestimates the weapon he accidentally kills the first shocker with. Peter underestimates Aunt May, believing she isn't noticing what he's doing. With all this being said, for as refreshing, well-paced, and entertaining as Spider-Man Homecoming is, it isn't perfect. Part of what makes Toombs such a compelling villain is that you can relate to his situation. He's been ousted out of his profession by a corporate monopoly, and so he's doing what he can to keep his family living well, even if it means breaking the law. He's willing to kill for the ones he loves. And we see, when he first meets Peter before the homecoming dance, that he's actually a pretty good dad to Liz. That he's nice to Peter before he realizes that he's Spider-Man. What I think undercuts this a little though, is that Peter's view of Iron Man doesn't really visibly change much in this film. Yes, by the end he does reject Tony's supervision, his offer to join the Avengers, his mentorship. He decides to be his own Spider-Man, but I feel like it would be even better if we saw him sympathize with Toombs a little more and reflect on Tony a bit differently because of it. Toombs is just a blue-collar worker driven to crime by Tony monopolizing his job. Surely Spidey could acknowledge that all while still stopping him, of course. I feel like this film would have been even better if that was part of why Peter rejected Tony in the end. I'm also not fond of the whole running gag about how hot Aunt May is. Delmar the bodega owner jokes about it, Tony jokes about it, the guys at the restaurant joke about it. I really just don't get what they're trying to achieve here with the whole MILF aspect. It comes across as a means of objectifying a character that is legitimately really important to Peter Parker. Also, some of the CGI can be a tad ropey in places too, with CGI doubles for Spidey at times when they're just not even necessary. Like, this here, you mean to tell me that they couldn't just green screen a shot here? Guy looks like he stepped out of Web of Shadows. That said, the CGI doubles weren't nearly as present or egregious as I remembered them being upon rewatch. Spidey does spend the majority of this film in a practical suit, and it looks gorgeous. Even better than it did in Captain America Civil War, where it was entirely mocap. Also, during the final battle, Spider-Man and Vulture, they land on the beach near Coney Island. You can see it in the background. How cool would it have been to have seen Peter and Vulture fight over Coney Island? Maybe use Coney Island, maybe have them fight on a roller coaster or something. That that would have been really cool, right? That's a missed opportunity. It's one of those things where if I didn't see Coney Island off in the distance and they just landed on a beach, it would have been fine. But you're showing me Coney Island in a Spider-Man movie. Come on, that's ripe with potential. But I suppose wanting to make use of an entire geography is much more of a Raimi thing and we gotta accept these directors for who they are. I'll talk a little more about John Watts as a director later. To be honest though, that's about all I have to say negatively about the film, just those four little things, and other than that, Spider-Man Homecoming is damn good. It's full of plucky spirit and a nice small-scale standalone adventure in the MCU. John Watts does a great job directing. He really captures that John Hughesy charm while also doing a great job with building tension. The scenes where Toombs is revealed as Liz's father and the Washington Monument scene are just masterclasses in tension. This film does not rely on the usual Spidey tropes and John Watts gets incredibly creative with the character of Spider-Man. I will say this, three incarnations in and the villains are still finding out Spidey's true identity every movie. Yeah, that was a bit disappointing, but the way it's handled here is absolutely worth it. Again, John Watts is excellent at building tension. I also really like the look of this film visually. It just, it feels more grounded while still having a nice colorful Spidey look. It looks like a classic Spider-Man comic. And the soundtrack too, we're on like theme music number four for live action Spider-Man. 
yet Michael Giacchino still managed to make something that is unique and memorable enough to hum off the top of your head. On a whole, Spider-Man Homecoming is just brilliant. It's Spider-Man and his world reconstructed for the modern age. It feels homegrown to the MCU. I can understand why the changes of certain characters like MJ now being Michelle or Flash Thompson or the introduction of Ned Leeds as Peter's best friend might feel alienating to longtime Spidey fans, but everything here works really well within the context of this movie and this universe, and it doesn't, to me anyway, feel conflicted with the fundamentals of who Spider-Man and Peter Parker are. It's a film that's able to take Spider-Man on his own terms and make something new with it. And I think that's the thing, on its own terms, this film is fantastic, but even I, being a long-term Spider-Man fan, still find a lot to love here. Entering reboot number two, Spider-Man Homecoming could have easily played it safe, but what we got in the end was incredibly refreshing. And the film was received really well for it. Spider-Man Homecoming was the perfect palate cleanser after the amazing Spider-Man 2. I can't help but be curious as to what we might have gotten if Andrew Garfield had continued on as Spider-Man, but Tom Holland is more than a worthy successor, and so Spider-Man is off to a flying start in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Hi, what's up? I'm Channel Pup, the mascot for the level-headed fanboy. Between spring of 2011 and winter of 2012, Spider-Man managed to die twice. Both Ultimate Peter and 616 Peter were out of the game, with Ultimate Peter being replaced by Miles Morales and 616 Peter being replaced by Otto Octavius. It looks like Sony and Marvel Studios wanted to break that record with Peter dying twice in the same year making this poor guy the Kenny of the Marvel Universe. Well, I mean, actually, that's not right. All superheroes are basically Kenny. That's just the way long-running comics work. We talked about Into the Spider-Verse, in which Peter Parker died last episode, and if you haven't seen that video already, please do check it out, as well as the rest of this retrospective. The playlist will be in the description, but... No, Into the Spider-Verse was not the only film to kill off Peter Parker to release in 2018. Now hold your horses there, sir. If you like videos about Spider-Man and Sonic the Hedgehog and other pop culture foibles, be sure to hit the subscribe button and hit the like button to help get more content like this in the algorithm. That YouTube algorithm is a merciless mistress. And if you want to help to support the production of these videos, be sure to check out the Patreon link in the description below and consider making a monthly pledge. Enjoy the rest of the video partner. Avengers Infinity War. Oh boy. It's all been leading up to this. Now bigger than ever, the Marvel Cinematic Universe unites to take down a deadly foe, Thanos. He's been built up over the course of all of these movies and he absolutely lives up to the hype, as did this film, which dealt a devastating blow to the Avengers, killing off tons of different characters. In the mix was good old Spider-Man which means Avengers Infinity War would be the very first Avengers movie to feature the Web Slinger. And he had a sizable role, working alongside Iron Man, Doctor Strange, Drax, Mantis, and Star-Lord, battling Thanos on his ruined homeworld of Titan. Spidey joins the adventure early in the film during the Battle of New York, and he tries to board Ebony Moore's ring-shaped ship, but passes out due to lack of oxygen. So Tony sends the Iron Spider suit up to help him to breathe and get him home. But Spidey isn't backing out. He can't be the friendly neighborhood Spider-Man if there is no friendly neighborhood. So against Iron Man's wishes, he sneaks onto the ship and he's off to space, where it's now official, he is an Avenger. He gets some great action moments and proves to be pretty helpful when trying to get the Infinity Gauntlet off of Thanos. But all of these efforts are in vain. Thanos wins. He retrieves all of the Infinity Stones, snaps his fingers, and half of all life in the universe is reduced to atoms. And Spidey is a part of that 50%. Interesting detail. When the other characters die, they don't have much of an understanding of what's happening to them. It's sudden, yet Spidey can feel it coming early and begins to panic. It's pretty harrowing to watch as he begs for his life before the inevitable happens and he crumbles into dust. So, the fact that Peter was so aware of his impending death could be attributed to the spider sense. Infinity War features the first explicit appearance of the spider sense in 
the MCU. A big part of Spider-Man Homecoming was Spidey trusting Tony's gadgets more than he trusted his own intuitions, so we never got to see the Spider-Sense, instead having him rely on the AI for most of the film. In Captain America Civil War, there are moments where you could assume his Spidey Sense is at work, as his eyes grow wide shortly before being attacked by Red Wing for one example. But in Infinity War, we get the first obvious use of the Spider-Sense, as the hairs on Peter's arm raise before heading into the Battle of New York. Moving over to Avengers Endgame, with Spidey now dead, Tony feels a great sense of responsibility, particularly for Peter, reinforcing why he overcompensated with him. But he is able to overcome this when he starts a family of his own with Pepper Potts. Nonetheless, the Avengers hatch a plan to restore the 50% of the universe's population and defeat Thanos once and for all. And so, the dead Avengers, along with Spidey, emerge from the portals to battle Thanos. Spider-Man Homecoming made a point of establishing a distance between Peter and Tony, with Peter misinterpreting Tony reaching for the car door for a hug, and Tony firmly stating, we're not there yet. When Tony finally sees Peter again five years later, he hugs him, showing that Tony's care for Peter wasn't purely out of accountability, there was a genuine affection there for him. But of course, we know how this goes. Tony sacrifices himself to defeat Thanos once and for all, taking the Infinity Gauntlet and snapping Thanos and his army out of existence, the gamma radiation from the gauntlet killing him in the process. Peter, Pepper, and Rhodey stand by as Tony breathes his last breaths, and Iron Man is gone. And that leads us into Spider-Man Far From Home. Now, sequels do work very differently in the MCU to how they would in Spidey's more standalone series, like The Amazing Spider-Man and the Raimi Trilogy. Because, like, with the MCU, like, you, you get Iron Man 3, but it's not a sequel to Iron Man 2, it's a sequel to The Avengers. And yeah, as with Spider-Man Far From Home, it's a film that doesn't just serve as a sequel to Spider-Man Homecoming, it's actually got to address the aftermath of Avengers Endgame. And it does so all through the eyes of the high schoolers at Midtown High, as the film begins with a poorly constructed memoriam for the fallen Avengers. Now, it is worth noting that Spider-Man Far From Home was not originally intended to be the film that would deal with the fallout of Avengers Endgame. At least not as far as Marvel Studios were concerned. But if you remember, in the Sony email leaks retrospective, a Spider-Man movie was mandated to release in 2019. And this is that movie. So with that on its plate, I guess it shouldn't be too much of a surprise that we completely gloss over Peter's identity being revealed to Aunt May at the end of Spider-Man Homecoming. Some time has obviously passed between Homecoming and now, and when we revisit Peter and May, they're at a point where she not only accepts the Spider-Man, but actively encourages it. It is unfortunate that we had to completely gloss over that, because we've never had a Peter and May dynamic where May knows that Peter is Spider-Man, or where it's readily obvious that she knows. We've never had that story where she finds out. We've always had the wink-wink kind of deal in Spider-Man movies, but we never had it explicitly stated that she knows, or had it treated as a plot point. There was an opportunity for something new here, but it's sadly an opportunity thrown aside while the film deals with the fallout of the Infinity Snap. It's by no means bad, but it's not ideal, and yeah, it's definitely a missed opportunity. Unfortunately, Aunt May is still being treated as an object of desire, this time for Happy Hogan, as there's a bit of a spark between the two, and I guess they're kind of a cute couple. Peter is getting calls from Nick Fury, but he's feeling conflicted about his future as Spider-Man. At the end of Spider-Man Homecoming, he was committed to being a friendly neighborhood Spider-Man rather than an outright Avenger. He stepped up for the Infinity War, and now he just wants a break. But the world, the media, S.H.I.E.L.D., Nick Fury, everyone is expecting him to be the world's new protector, the next Iron Man. The new sole survivor of the Avengers, Earth's mightiest hero. And Peter? just needs a break from all of it. He just wants some time to be Peter Parker after being dead for five years. It's not outright Spider-Man no more, 
but it's a burnout story. Peter would rather use his Spider-Man persona to aid in fundraisers for the Feast Center to help with the post-blip displacement efforts, rather than face off against Avengers-level threats because he simply doesn't feel like he's cut out for that. He's not Iron Man, and he's constantly reminded of this everywhere he goes. There are reminders of the man who saved the world, Tony Stark. Fortunately for Peter, he has things to distract himself with. Peter's class are going on a trip to Europe, and he sees this as an opportunity to detense after everything and put together a life for himself beyond being Spider-Man. And so he plans to impress MJ on this trip. So Peter's outright crush on MJ in this film does come a little out of left field after he expressed very little interest in her in Homecoming, at least romantically wise anyway. Teenage love do be like that, but Peter and MJ's relationship should be meaningful. It would have been nice to have seen them interact a little, maybe show that they've gotten to know each other a little more between Homecoming and now, so now he likes her because of that. It's not something they need to spend more than a couple of minutes on, but nah, from the jump, Peter just likes MJ and wants to impress her. Immediately, I like what I'm seeing, but there is a small issue. This is too fast paced. We're effectively speed running the important motivating factors for this film. Peter wanted to go back to being a friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. Aunt May accepting Peter as Spidey. Peter developing feelings for MJ. We just charged through all of that at 100 miles an hour. And that problem is going to persist for the entire film because this film is absolutely packed with the subtext and consequences of stories far larger than this. One thing I'll say though, the plane scene is an excellent example of the Parker luck, where Peter just can't seem to catch a break. He ends up sat next to Mr. Harrington for the long haul flight, while a new character, Brad, is sat next to MJ. Brad being another rival for Peter fighting for MJ's affections. Now, there's a fair deal of criticism aimed at Brad. On one hand, people say this character should have just been Flash Thompson, but that's kind of retroactive recasting. Like, I wouldn't say that's all that fair. Plus, he's actually fairly reasonable in some regards, which we'll talk about later. I think Brad feeds nicely into the themes of inadequacy, though. That said, I also feel like more could have been done with this. Maybe Brad is Peter's intellectual rival as well, or a bit of a hero in his own right. All we really know about him is that he's a handsome young man. That's the only way in which he actually competes with Peter. So while on the flight, Ned and Betty fall in love and their sudden relationship serves as a common relief. So the problem with this is that it's all a big funny joke how these two suddenly fall in love, yet that's exactly how this film has sincerely approached Peter's feelings for MJ. Either way though, these two are fun to have on screen together. I also like the addition of a partner character for Mr. Harrington being Mr. Dell, played by J.B. Smoove. I loved J.B. Smoove in Curb Your Enthusiasm and was thrilled to see him here. He's a fantastic comedic actor and him and Mr. Harrington play off of each other really well. I think what Far From Home does a nice job of is emulating the charm of a National Lampoon's vacation film. Once again, we're back to the old school comedy approach for Far From Home and it does this nicely. While, yes, comedy is a pillar of the MCU, I like that the characters in MCU Spider-Man films are suitably more goofy and awkward than the characters that would populate any other MCU project. Ned, Betty, Flash, Mr. Harrington, and Mr. Dell are all great side characters. It's not too long, though, until the film kicks it up a notch, as Venice is under attack from Hydra Man, the Water Elemental. Peter quickly puts on a disguise and heads into battle, but naturally he's pretty useless when pitted against a water elemental. Fortunately, he's not the only hero present at this time. Enter Mysterio, a swashbuckling superhero. He shoots lasers out of his hands, just like Iron Man. He rocks a mythical looking cape, just like Thor, and he makes quick work of Hydra Man. It turns out this is what Nick Fury wanted to talk to Peter about as he hijacks the entire school trip, kidnapping Peter from his hotel room, bringing him into a meeting with Mysterio, who is revealed to be Quentin Beck, a hero from another universe. His world was destroyed by the Elementals, and Thanos' snap has brought them here. Mysterio chased them through, and Nick Fury is calling upon Spider-Man to join the battle. As leverage, Fury gives Spider-Man Tony's last gift for him, 
his Edith glasses. So the next stop on the field trip is Prague, because that is where the Fire Elemental will be. Nick Fury has completely taken control of Peter's class trip, and yeah, this is admittedly pretty out of character for Nick Fury. The Elementals supposedly destroyed Mysterio's world, yet S.H.I.E.L.D. are bringing Peter, along with all of his school friends, into battle. Nick Fury is outright incompetent in this film, but don't worry, there is an explanation, and we will talk about that later when it's revealed. At the very least, there is a line of dialogue about how Maria Hill has been trying to get the government to evacuate Prague, so they're not completely stupid. Now, Peter does address concerns that if his classmates see Spider-Man in Europe, they'll put two and two together, and thus figure out that Spider-Man is on the field trip with them, therefore Spider-Man could be Peter Parker. It looks like Nick Fury is going to let him go based on that, and Mysterio will take care of things from here, but instead, Peter is given a new suit by a Lady S.H.I.E.L.D. agent. The S.H.I.E.L.D. agent instructs Peter to try on the new suit, and while he's getting undressed, Brad walks in and sees Peter getting undressed with the Lady S.H.I.E.L.D. agent and takes a photo. And he blackmails Peter, he tells him he's going to show it to MJ. Now, back on the coach, Peter discovers what the Edith glasses are actually capable of, and he asks them to erase the photo from Brad's phone not realizing that Edith is linked to the Stark satellite, which is full of deadly drones. A drone is deployed to kill Brad, so Peter has to distract the other students on the bus by pointing at baby mountain goats before leaping into the sky to take down the drone. There's a gag about Betty Brandt telling Peter that she's noticed, only to follow up by telling him that it was his new look that she noticed, as his hair is all scruffy and he's wearing the glasses. So okay, as far as the identity thing, Peter being able to maintain his secret identity by telling his classmates to just look the other way, basically. It's contrived as hell. I think deliberately so. The whole point is the amount of near misses in regard to the secret identity and Parker Luck being that, fortunately, everything always works out in the end. This scene is commonly cited as the worst scene of the film, and okay, I kind of get it. I do think that tonally, yeah, it's a bit too cartoony, a bit too contrived, even for just what it's going for. The idea being that he comes so close to blowing his cover but gets lucky, okay, fair enough, but can we not do better than everyone just looking away because Peter told them to? I'm thinking a better idea would be for Peter to run into the coach bathroom, climb out the window, then take down the drone while doing everything he can to stay on the roof of the bus and not be seen through the windows. Again. It's just too fast paced, they're trying to do everything too quickly. The drone is taken down, Edith worked, the photo is removed from Brad's phone, while Brad tries to convince MJ that he definitely saw this and definitely snapped a picture. So rather than enjoying the street parties in Prague, Fury arranges for the students to be taken to an opera to keep them inside while the next elemental attacks. Peter does say that he is worried about his friends being in danger, and Nick Fury decides to be a manipulative asshole, saying Peter has no right to criticize when he almost blew them up with a drone on the coach. But here's the thing, Dick Fury. Peter's a kid that just wants to help old ladies cross the street. You're the director of freaking S.H.I.E.L.D., the biggest strategic organization in the world, and your strategy stinks. I'll bet that you didn't even cross-reference Mysterio. I doubt you're even the real Nick Fury. Also, way to change the subject. God, Nick Fury sucks in this movie. I hate Nick Fury. One minute he's all like, oh, you need to be the next Iron Man. The next minute he's like, clearly you're not ready, idiot. Like, wh what do you want from him? Peter is not asking to be the next Iron Man. So Mysterio is someone that Peter can confide in. He understands what Peter's going through, and he's critical of Nick Fury. He gives Peter that sense of security in himself that Iron Man could have offered. That he's not alone as a superhero, that he's right to want to remain a friendly neighborhood Spider-Man, and that Nick Fury is out of line trying to force him into being the new Iron Man. He serves as a source of validation for Peter. But the mission begins. So, Spider-Man in his new black stealth suit gets geared up to take down the fire elemental Molten Man. But matters get worse as Ned, Betty, and MJ sneak out of the opera house, and Ned and Betty get on the Ferris wheel, just as Molten Man attacks. So now, Spider-Man and Mysterio must work together, not just to take down Molten Man, Spidey has to save Ned and Betty. 
To help him maintain his facade as a superhero who definitely isn't Spider-Man, Ned dubs him Night Monkey, a European Spidey knockoff. So while Night Monkey and Mysterio fight together side by side against Molten Man, MJ notices something fishy, when Spider-Man appears to pull a piece of drone off of the Ferris wheel. So MJ takes it with her. Mysterio sacrifices himself to defeat Molten Man, destroying him from the inside. Fortunately though, Mysterio manages to survive. So Nick Fury decides to manipulate Peter some more, telling him he needs to step up as an Avenger, go all in. There are no part-time superheroes, you either save the entire world or you save none of it. The war with the Elementals is over and won, but Nick wants Spider-Man on call and he doesn't intend on leaving him alone. So Peter has to confront the idea of losing his entire personal life to being the world's savior. He's literally got the weight of the world on his shoulders. Recognizing this, Mysterio takes him for drinks. Now, there is something that strikes me as a bit odd about the fact that Peter has gone to such lengths as having an entirely separate superhero alter ego and suit to protect his identity, yet he sat at this bar without a mask on. I mean, okay, the Night Monkey suit is really just a pretty non-specific black outfit and it's worn open like a jacket, and the chances are he won't be seeing any of these people ever again, so it is what it is, but the optics here are a little funky. Peter puts the pieces together. Mysterio should be the one to take Iron Man's place as the world's savior. He's the one who had the power to actually fight the elementals, while Spider-Man was powerless against them. Mysterio can shoot lasers, he can fly, he's Buzz Lightyear, he's willing to sacrifice, just like Tony was. So he should be the one to take Tony's place, logically. Peter gives him the Edith glasses, and when Mysterio wears them, he bears a striking resemblance to Tony. It's almost like it was Destiny or something. So Peter leaves, and then we get the big reveal. The bar is not a bar, the people there are all actors, Mysterio is a fraud. All of his powers, the elementals, are all illusions projected by drones. The damage is real, the casualties are real, the fatalities are real, as the drones are able to simulate the damage of the elementals using firepower and shockwaves. As for Quentin Beck, he's a former Stark employee. He developed an augmented reality system that Tony used in Captain America Civil War that could have been used for greater purposes, but was instead used as therapy for Tony over his dead parents. Quinton was fired because he was deemed unstable and did not receive credit for his inventions. The other people that helped with the operation are also all former employees that Stark screwed over, including my favorite of the bunch, William, whose presence in the MCU dates back to Iron Man 1. He is the man that Obadiah Stane loudly berated with a, for some reason, very iconic quote. Now, this scene should be the dictionary definition of an exposition dump, but it's handled with such gleeful enthusiasm that I can't really fault it. Jake Gyllenhaal turns into a scenery-chewing, larger-than-life villain in the blink of an eye. The gang are all toasting each other. Now look, as far as twists go, should it really have been a big twist at the halfway point of the film that Mysterio was the villain? Anyone who knows Mysterio would know that he's the villain. At the same time though, these movies are not made purely with comic fans in mind, and Mysterio isn't quite as A-list as, say, Green Goblin, Doc Ock, Venom, or even Electro. Not outright obscure, but definitely not an A-lister as far as the general consciousness goes. As someone who knows Mysterio already, heck, he's my favorite comic book villain of all time, this works. What makes it work is that Spider-Man has put all of his trust in him. He trusts him more than he trusts himself. The danger ramps up, and we really feel it when we get to the twist. It's not necessarily surprising, but it's a gut punch, so it's still impactful. I also appreciate that this twist doesn't wait too long to materialize, coming in at exactly the halfway point. A problem I often have with twist villains is that we don't spend enough time with their villainous personas, meaning we miss out. With Mysterio, fortunately that's not an issue, as there's still plenty of movie left by the time he's revealed. So following the incident in Prague, the school trip is cut short. The flights are being booked for the return home. Peter won't get his chance to wow MJ in Paris, the city of love. But he does get a chance to hang with her for a bit, and the two have been needing it. It's a nice bit of time to explore some of MJ's more historical interests in the trip. Peter wants to confess his feelings to her, but she tries to preempt his confession by telling him she knows he's Spider-Man. She's pieced it together. Washington, Night Monkey, all of it. It seems to turn out MJ wasn't really interested in Peter for Peter. 
but because she suspected that he was Spider-Man. Which Peter's a little taken aback by, naturally. MJ shows Peter a piece of the drone she claimed from the Molten Man fight, and it starts acting up, revealing a projection of a new Elemental and Mysterio battling it. Peter susses out the Elementals were fake, Mysterio is a fraud. With MJ now in on Mysterio's secret, Peter reveals to MJ that he's Spider-Man, and it turns out MJ wasn't actually as sure that Peter was Spider-Man as she led on and was just dicking him about. I do just want to say I really like this depiction of MJ. This MJ is not like comics MJ. She's effectively a brand new character, and I mean, yeah, she is. She's not Mary Jane. She's Michelle Jones. She's not a supermodel or an actress, at least not yet. I do kind of hope that we're not abandoning that out of some delusion that women can't pursue professions in entertainment and modeling and be strong characters at the same time, because that would be regressive. I say that because Spider-Man PS4 also ditched MJ's classic profession in favor of making her a journalist with zero common sense that takes Spider-Man for granted. This MJ is a good character. She's not too socially adjusted, a total introvert, pretty solitary, that likes to just kind of play around with people for her own amusement, but in a benign, harmless, and silly way. She's got a dark sense of humor, dark interests, and yeah, she's a total cynic. Which makes for a nice dichotomy between her and this plucky, more well-adjusted Peter. Kind of a bit of a switcheroo on the typical Peter-MJ dynamic. Fun, new twist, and again, different doesn't mean bad. I do wish we understood a little more of where this comes from, though. Her roots, her history. None of the side characters really get that treatment here. We don't know any of their parents. The most we really know is that Flash Thompson, yeah, his parents are around and kicking, but they spend very little time with him. Spider-Man Far From Home is a movie that lives in the moment, I guess. I like the character traits of this new MJ, and I just wish we could learn a little more about where these traits come from. Maybe that's just who she is, but I don't know, there's gonna be a reason why she's so introverted. So Beck and his crew are rehearsing the next battle with the final Elemental, who doesn't have a name, so I'm just gonna refer to him as the Supreme Elemental, because it sounds cool and I'm still riding the Sonic Frontiers high. But William informs him that one of the drones is missing a projector making Beck paranoid that it's evidence of their operation. He tracks it down remotely and finds that it's been in possession of Peter and MJ. They know what he's up to, and therefore they have to die. I absolutely love this scene and the reveal of the Mysterio suit being CGI'd onto a mocap suit. That's pretty meta. I just, I love the idea of this superhero fraud in the MCU using the actual tech made to use MCU movies. And he's also integrated Edith into his very own fishbowl, which was a nice touch, nice way of kind of making it his own. So Peter travels to Berlin to tell Nick Fury about his discovery, only to be intercepted by Mysterio. The Nick Fury and Maria Hill we met up with in Berlin? Fake. The headquarters? It's a parking lot. Mysterio tortures Spider-Man, trapping him in a world of his greatest fears, while Peter tries to determine what is and isn't real. Also note that in this scene, Spidey's previous suits are projected onto him by the drones, and that was dearly needed, as so far, Spidey spent the majority of his time as Night Monkey, and let's be real, this scene wouldn't hit nearly as hard with him in the j Night Monkey suit. This scene is a love letter to Ditko, Spidey, and Mysterio confrontations. Green smoke fills the screen. The framing of each shot is very reminiscent to how Ditko would compose his art. Mysterio's design is incredibly faithful to Ditko's art, and having the classic Spidey suit here just completes that. This is the last we see of the Stark suit, which was the very first suit we saw MCU Spidey wear. It's the suit he made his MCU debut in, and it's a welcome last hurrah as Mysterio continually breaks Spidey down, as he's thrown into nightmarish versions of Midtown High, the Eiffel Tower, Queens. We even get a fake MJ who Mysterio drops from the Eiffel Tower. Remember the Hall of Mirrors from the Spider-Man 2 game in Mysterio's Funhouse of Doom? We get a scene highly reminiscent to that as Spidey is attacked by his reflections until he's stripped down to the very first suit he made that he wore for the third act of Spider-Man Homecoming, the suit he had before he met Tony Stark. Mysterio torments him over the death of Tony Stark. This is the very first confrontation between Spider-Man and Mysterio as enemies, 
and is perfect. Mysterio makes one hell of an impression as a villain, and this scene goes all in. Full of easter eggs to comic book moments between Spider-Man and Mysterio, to Spidey's webs melting to smoke just like the cover of Amazing Spider-Man 13, to Mysterio lifting off his fishbowl revealing no head, just like in Amazing Spider-Man 142. This abruptly ends when Spidey's rescued by Nick Fury. Spidey's back in the real world, free from Mysterio's projections. Fury asks Peter who he told about Mysterio, and he answers that MJ, Ned, and possibly Betty know. But then, once again, this Nick Fury is just Mysterio in disguise, as he tells Peter that, thanks to him, all of his friends have to die. Surrounding him with more illusions, blinding him to reality, Mysterio backs Spider-Man onto the tracks of a bullet train, and he's taken out. Mysterio then calls for the Midtown High School trip flight to be diverted via England. Mysterio is a magnificent bastard, and he's especially vicious here. He's so callously determined to kill Peter dead and all of his friends, but also insists on tormenting Spider-Man along the way. And this is probably the closest a Spider-Man villain has ever come to actually killing Spider-Man. Following that sudden ramp in intensity, we do get a brief moment of relief. Night Monkey is held in a Dutch jail cell, but this is the Netherlands. Everybody's very friendly, so he's able to just get out with relative ease and get into contact with Happy Hogan. Now this scene here is excellent. So Happy Hogan rocks up in the Stark jet, and just to cement the impact that Mysterio has had on Peter, the toll he's taken on his confidence, Peter makes Happy confirm that he's the real deal as he stands injured and terrified in the field. So while Happy helps Peter to stitch up his wounds, the two have a heart to heart. This is a very important scene that I think a lot of people kind of underestimate. I think there's a lot of messages here that fly over people's heads. We see the toll that everything is taking on Peter, as he's been seeing the impact Iron Man had on the world everywhere he goes, and he feels like the world is expecting him to be the next Iron Man. Spider-Man is the sole survivor of the Avengers, he's Earth's defender, and Fury expects him to be the suit of armor around the world that Iron Man was. And it's here where Peter outright says it. He's not Iron Man. Happy tells him, yeah, he's right, he's not Iron Man and he never will be. But, like Spidey, Iron Man was also unable to trust his own instincts. But that one person he did have faith in was Peter. So with that in mind, like Iron Man, Peter's been broken down, he's at rock bottom, and all he can do is fight the villain and save his friends. So Peter and Happy strategize. Peter makes himself a brand new upgraded suit, while Happy sets the scene with some music. Not sure why they call it the upgraded suit when it has less capabilities and functionality than the Stark suit, with less web to shoot as well. But I mean, design-wise, yeah, I'd say it's an upgrade. It's very clean looking. And I do like a slightly less teched out Spidey, so hell yeah. Now, wow, this scene. This scene is one that I think people take different messages from, and I think that's a defining factor in how this movie stacks up for you. This scene is pivotal. On one hand, both Peter and Happy both directly spell it out. Peter is not the next Iron Man and never will be. But then, Peter starts making his new suit using tech on the Stark jet. Happy puts Black in Black on and looks at Peter, as he doesn't look massively dissimilar from Tony Stark when he was building his own suits. So, conflicting themes? Well, not quite. I think on one hand, you can take from the exchange that, no, Peter is an Iron Man. But then you could say what follows negates that. But I think to say that kind of underestimates the complexity with which this idea is handled. It's all pretty nuanced, all things considered. The film acknowledges that two things can be true at once. Spider-Man is not the next Iron Man, nor is he the next Tony Stark. There isn't one, but what's explored here, the battle Peter is losing to himself, the sense of imposter syndrome, is one that Iron Man fought as well, as evidenced particularly in Iron Man 3, where Tony was suffering anxiety attacks after the Battle of New York. So what is this scene actually trying to say? Sentimentality distorts reality. Post-Endgame, Iron Man is a messianic figure, and Peter is continually told by Nick Fury that he needs to fit that mold. Mysterio, in his heroic form, served to undermine Spider-Man, to bring his sense of inadequacy to the forefront. Mysterio in his villainous form serves to torment him over that, and to continually invalidate him. This scene with Happy reinforces that, like Peter, Tony Stark has felt these feelings about himself before. That Peter's self-doubt is normal, understandable, and shared. 
It's normal to feel like you can't live up to the legend, and that Tony Stark was ultimately a flawed human being in the same way that Peter is. So with that in mind, Peter shouldn't give up. He doesn't need to fit the Iron Man mold, he can break the mold. Spider-Man doesn't need the weight of the world on his shoulders, he just needs to stop Mysterio and save his friends. As for the music choice with Back in Black, well, yes, it is the song that played at the start of Iron Man 1. But it is also the song that played at the very start of the MCU. Thanks to both Iron Man 2 and Avengers Assemble, I think Shoot to Thrill is far more synonymous with Iron Man, and had they used that song, I would have a bit more objection, but I think what this represents is that after Avengers Endgame, the MCU is beginning again. This time, Spider-Man is leading the charge. So we cut back to Peter's class and Brad speaks out to acknowledge how Peter is always slinking off and how he's clearly leading a double life. MJ, Mr. Harrington, and Mr. Dell basically told him to mind his own business and shut the fuck up. And so they move on. So I'd say that this scene here is just as egregious, if not more so than the coach scene. Again, it's contrived, it's overly convenient. It'd be one thing for Mr. Harrington and Mr. Dell to just ignore Peter's absence, but Brad has a good point. They are in Europe, very, very far from home. They're getting on connecting buses, trains, and flights, all to get home, and Peter isn't there. It's outright brought to their attention, and they just give Peter the benefit of the doubt and tell Brad to shut up, when the entire reason they're abandoning the trip is due to elemental monsters rising from the ground to attack devastating cities and towns. This is just outright contrived and makes Mr. Harrington and Mr. Dell two incredibly incompetent teachers, beyond just a comedic level. Hi there, Pup from the editing stage again. I just need to make another quick clarification. Peter tells Ned to call Aunt May to ask her to tell his teachers that he's now staying with family in Berlin temporarily. This explains his absence, so this is basically a moot point. My bad. So driving the London bus is one of Mysterio's crew, while Mysterio warns Nick Fury of the impending attack on London from the Supreme Elemental, bigger and tougher than ever before thanks to Edith's access to the Stark drone satellite. I love the build-up to this final battle, as not only do we see the Supreme attack London Bridge and all of the students in danger, but we also cut to shots of the drones underwater, causing the shockwaves, making the impact of the Supreme feel all the more tangible. It's nice that, because the audience is now in on the facade, we get a surprisingly believable peek behind the curtain of Mysterio's illusion. Nick Fury continually asks Mysterio for updates as he battles the Supreme, and this is where Mysterio slips. His writer has to come up with a response on the fly, and at this point, it's just too contrived, and Nick Fury no longer suspends his disbelief. It's all very meta, isn't it? The way they're handling Mysterio is all very meta. So Nick Fury and Maria Hill witness Spidey free-falling into the battle in his new suit of his very own as he heads straight into the belly of the beast directly into the Supreme, where inside the drones are all at work. It's a visually stunning sequence, which draws inspiration from the incredibly vibrant and abstract imagery of Into the Spider-Verse. And yeah, if you're gonna draw inspiration from that, then big thumbs up from me. And now's the perfect time to do so, as Mysterio is a very visual villain. Beck clocks Spidey, breaking the drone's formation, causing the illusion to glitch and break down. Realizing that not only is Spider-Man alive, but he's still a threat, Mysterio is pissed. He's out for blood. He sends drones to kill Nick Fury, destroy the Stark Jet, chase down Happy and Peter's classmates, and attack the general public. The original plan for the Elementals is over and foil. Now on to plan B, a drone terrorist attack in London. The illusions are over. This is no longer between Spider-Man, the Supreme, and Mysterio. This is between Spider-Man and Beck. No illusions, just packing a ton of firepower. The drones chase Happy and Peter's friends into the Tower of London as they hide and try to fend them off. As they all prepare for their eventual demise, they confess their regrets. This is a really brief moment, but I do really like how we take this moment to have these characters show their true colors, even if it is just brief, particularly MJ, who confesses her own social issues. It's bookended by comedic relief, and I do wish we could go deeper still than this, but this is something. So for this final battle, Spidey is trying to reach Beck to shut down the drones and save his friends in London, but the drones are fighting back against him. 
So it's Spidey just being hit with a constant barrage of bullets, shockwaves, he even gets a few cars thrown at him, flamethrowers, the works. He's just taking all of the abuse here. And he's just fighting off this horde of death machines designed by his genius idol, controlled by the total sociopath that he once trusted. And I love that this scene really makes the most out of that premise. It's a high-flying kinetic spectacle as Spider-Man uses his ingenuity to take out the drones. There's seemingly no escape from Beck's forces, but Spider-Man is on top form. He's absolutely unstoppable. And it's ramped up a notch when he runs out of webs and has to find a way to reach Beck without his webs available. He propels himself upward using the London Bridge scenery and a shockwave from one of the drones where he has Beck cornered. But then Beck uses the drones to blind him to the real world around him. At this point, Spider-Man puts full faith in his spider sense or as this film calls it, Peter Tingle, as he battles his way out. Beck dismisses Edith's safety protocols and finds himself in the crossfire of his own drones, defeating him. Spidey goes to Beck as he lay writhing in pain from his bullet wound. Beck relinquishes the Edith glasses to Peter, but Peter knows it's BS and detects that this Beck is an illusion, and that the real Beck is behind him, ready to shoot him in a last-ditch effort. Peter grabs the gun and swipes Edith, and it's an epic moment. Beck is completely defeated, and Peter uses Edith to shut off all the drones, saving London and his friends. Beck appears to die from his bullet wounds, with his last words being that people will believe anything. Peter asks if this is real, and Edith responds telling him that all of the illusions are shut off. We'll revisit this subject a little later on. So MJ runs to Peter on the bridge, and the two share a little smoochy smooch. Now dating, they return to New York, and we see that Flash's parents aren't there to pick him up. Spidey gets a triumphant final swing, just like old times, and this also marks MCU Spider-Man's first proper swing through the skyscrapers of Manhattan, and boy does it ever feel good and rewarding to see him reach these heights. This final swing is a lot of fun as well, as MCU Spidey does things a bit differently to how Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield's respective Spideys did. We don't just see him swing, we see him deploy his web wings to glide, we see how he takes selfies as he goes, how he texts MJ, and it just adds a lot of extra character. It's just a lot of extra layers here. I do think those layers can perhaps get a little intrusive at times, like, I still think it's cooler seeing Spider-Man swinging around just as Spider-Man, rather than seeing him swinging around with his phone in his hand at all times. But still, it, it's a character moment. I get what they're going for, like, each Spider-Man has their own way of doing the web-swinging thing. You know, Tobey Maguire is very graceful, very floaty. Andrew Garfield is very athletic and sporty. And Tom Holland is just very ADHD as he's constantly being distracted by everything. Cool, I, I'm fine with that. Where's Peter swinging to? A date with MJ. And the date? The skies of Manhattan, and boy does she not enjoy web swinging. So it all seems like a happy ending. Mysterious defeated, the kids are safe, he got the girl. But we've obviously got two credit scenes left to go. The first one, the mid credits serving as more the true ending of the film, as Spidey and MJ land, a news report plays on one of NYC's many giant screens. Footage of Mysterio's death, manipulated, edited, revealing Spider-Man as in control of the drones that attack London. And not only that, Mysterio reveals Spider-Man's true identity to the entire world, ending this story on a major cliffhanger just when things were going so well for old Webhead. This footage is also presented by none other than J. Jonah Jameson, with J.K. Simmons reprising his role as the Daily Bugle's editor. I watched this in a European cinema. In Europe, we don't really cheer at movies. It's more of an American thing. We are a miserable people. But people cheered loudly when they saw J.K. Simmons return. Like, I, I heard more cheering for this than any moment in Avengers Endgame when I saw that on opening night. That's the power of Spider-Man. This is quite a different take on the Daily Bugle and J. Jonah Jameson, with it clearly drawing inspiration from InfoWars. The entire setup is reminiscent of InfoWars, and Jonah has much more of an Alex Jones-inspired appearance. Now, on one hand, I am happy and grateful that they got J.K. Simmons back as J. Jonah Jameson, because I don't think anyone else could ever play that role as well as he does. He's born for that role. But I've got to make a quick critique here. I don't like how modern interpretations of J. Jonah Jameson will often draw inspiration from Alex Jones. Insomniac's take on J.J. did the same. Here's the thing. J. Jonah Jameson is a bit of an asshole. He's arrogant, he's got it out for Spider-Man, he pushes his own narrative when it comes to Spidey. But he's also a principled man. 
he stepped up to protect Peter on numerous occasions. He's more just a flawed person. Then there's Alex Jones, a man who harassed the families of the Sandy Hook shooting fatalities denying the event and incited harassment of them by his followers. Don't insult J. Jonah Jameson. J. Jonah Jameson is not Alex Jones. One is a flawed guy paranoid about the dude who shoots webs out of his wrists. The other is genuine human filth. That personal reservation aside though, this is going down in history as perhaps the most game-changing, anxiety-inducing mid credit scenes of all time and it's just an excellent cliffhanger to end this film on. Imagine being one of the dumbasses though that still leaves the cinema before the mid credit scenes with MCU movies and then just going into Spider-Man No Way Home wondering what the hell is going on. This scene is vital, it's the true ending. It's the bad ending. It does also give some payoff to the constant near misses with Peter's identity and this film. He gets incredibly lucky in this film with incredibly contrived ways of keeping his secret identity secret. So to have Mysterio at the last minute just reveal his secret identity to the world? That's an excellent subversion. As for the post credit scene. There's no relief from that. You're still absolutely left reeling by the identity reveal. However, if you notice that Nick Fury and Maria Hill seemed out of character, well, that's just because they weren't Nick Fury and Maria Hill. Instead, scrolls, while the real Nick Fury is holidaying in space. Now, I think you could still make judgment on Fury's character based on just the fact that he's entrusted the operation with scrolls, but. It's less egregious, or I guess at least it's not as present of an issue as it would be if this were just regular everyday Nick Fury. So that is Spider-Man Far From Home, and it's just ripe for discussion. I remember all of the theories about how they'd solve Spider-Man's identity reveal, whether or not they'd just sit with it. I was worried that they'd keep Peter's identity revealed, and the reason this worried me was simply that I feel the secret identity is a major contributing factor to Spidey's individuality within the MCU. Other MCU characters have public identities, and I just don't see any merit in trying to enforce uniformity onto every superhero in your universe. Fortunately, that obviously wasn't the case, but that's a conversation for another day. So, is Mysterio dead? This is another subject of debate. See, the thing is, Beck does not strike me as the kind of guy that would be willing to die for the bit. He's cunning, clever, sure, but he's also cowardly. I don't see him plotting for his own death, and I don't think he's dead. For starters, Edith did not explicitly say he was dead, and there's a reason for that. It would be very easy for her to actually confirm that he's actually dead, and there's a reason why they didn't do that. But let's also analyze some other aspects of Mysterio's death scene. We saw when Mysterio tried to shoot Spider-Man that he projects doubles of himself. The version of him that was shot in the gut may well have been the double. After all, we see Mysterio get shot in the gut, fall down, and that's him there, but that's also the version of him that gives him the Edith glasses before the real him tried to shoot him from behind. So was the real Beck even shot? He seems pretty worse for wares, but then in the after credits, he seems pretty okay while he records Peter's true identity. Not to mention wearing the full Mysterio suit, when in the actual final battle he was just wearing the mocap suit. You could say it's CGI projected on there. Even so, I think there is a reason for the mismatch. It is also worth noting that storyboard artwork and concept art for the sequel, Spider-Man No Way Home, reveal that Mysterio was planned to return and in an early version of the film in a big way. Storyboards reveal Mysterio as the one to kill Aunt May, and concept art shows Mysterio battling Doctor Strange atop the Statue of Liberty. Besides, Mysterio fakes everything, so it's very in line with his character to fake his own death. Either way, dead or alive, he's a specter that will haunt the life of Peter Parker for the rest of his mortal days. He's the villain who finally outsmarted Peter and won. So theories aside, let's talk about what we have here with Spider-Man Far From Home. Let's talk about it as a film, as among Spidey fans, this one is pretty divisive. I think it is fair to say that Spider-Man Far From Home has some issues. 
It's a missed opportunity to gloss over Aunt May discovering Peter's true identity. It's incredibly convenient that revisiting these characters, Aunt May is just completely at peace with Peter being Spider-Man, particularly how after in Spider-Man Homecoming, we established that Aunt May was very protective of Peter and didn't appreciate him keeping secrets from her. The pacing of this film is incredibly fast, and I think it could afford to slow down a bit and spend some more time with the characters. I'll say this, it does more than the bare minimum with its characters. I feel like it could spend even less time and still be a solid film, but we only really know the characters of Ned, MJ, Betty, and Flash vicariously through Peter. We only really see his interactions with them, so we know very little about their own goals, their own interests. I don't view this as a problem so much as something I would have appreciated some expansion upon. Consider it, I guess, Code Amber. It's one of those things where it's just I'd appreciate if they'd aim a little higher. In terms of Code Red critiques though, yeah, the contrived moments like the coach scene, it's just sloppy. Not enough to ruin the film, but these are very sloppy moments. Spider-Man Far From Home is not as meticulously crafted as Spider-Man Homecoming. It's a little sloppier in areas, a little more contrived, and the pacing doesn't do this story its full justice. And it's not helped by the fact that this film had to be built upon the aftermath of Avengers Endgame. We are seeing some of the detriments of the MCU sequel model starting to bleed in here. With all that being said, I think the highs for Spider-Man Far From Home are very high, and it is still a step up from Spider-Man Homecoming in various aspects. I mentioned that Homecoming didn't really compare to previous films in the action department, as it was quite a low-to-the-ground film. The action just really wasn't all that ambitious. Spider-Man Far From Home absolutely steps things up a notch in that department. The battles against the Elementals were thrilling, but the real highlights were Spider-Man's battles with Mysterio in Berlin and London. The action is high-flying, intense, and kinetic, and of all of the MCU Spider-Man films so far, I'd definitely say that Spider-Man Far From Home has the least CGI issues of the bunch. I mentioned that Homecoming could look a little ropey in spots. There's a notable improvement in Far From Home. The only scene that really looked all that computer generated was the Berlin scene, and go figure, it's literally CGI in-universe. And even then, it's still a few notches up from Homecoming CGI doubles. Like with Homecoming, I have no issues with Spider-Man Far From Home choosing to distance itself from Spider-Man's origin story. Once again, there's no mention of Uncle Ben or radioactive spiders or any of that, and that really is fine by me. The closest you get is Ben Parker's initials on Peter's suitcase. There's just a little nod, and I think that's tasteful enough. I know that there are folks that do take issue with the fact that the suitcase gets destroyed and it's just brushed off, but like... There's a lot of mementos and inheritance getting absolutely blown up in this film, including the iconic Stark suit for Spidey. Rest in peace, you absolute beauty. Though I must say the upgraded suit is a worthy successor. Speaking of suits though, did we really need Night Monkey and a stealth suit? Nah, you could have gotten away with just having Spidey rock in the Stark suit, and I probably would have liked that better. MJ pieced everything together anyway, so in the long run it was kind of just pointless. You could have had... Fury just insists upon Peter helping, and to hell with the disguise. Just an excuse for toy sales, I guess. But in regard to the contention of Ben's suitcase being blown up and Peter not really reacting, I'll be real, I don't need to see my guy mourn a suitcase to recognize Spider-Man's origin story. Having all that happen off-screen only makes way for new adventures, and I'll absolutely take that. Fury's characterization is another lower point of the film. You either roll with it though or you don't. I'm fine with it, I appreciate the scroll reveal because, yeah, he was out of character for most of this film. I'd deem the scroll thing an acceptable resolution to that. As for Mysterio, he is the absolute highlight of the film. He's manipulative, he's vicious, he chews the scenery. They found inventive ways of tying him into the Marvel Cinematic Universe, making him convincing and believable. But most of all, he stayed true to the roots of the character. This fraud, this opportunist, nothing is too low for him. And yes, I appreciate that they faithfully adapted his classic design, fishbowl and all. That one made me a very happy chappy, as Mysterio has such a striking design, and they took full advantage of that. I'm also glad we did get one scene where he just went all in on an all-out nightmare world for Spidey. And having him serve as kind of like a commentary on superhero movies, with like the mocap suit and Nick Fury's suspension of disbelief, and how it falls apart in the third act, that was pretty clever. 
at its absolute core, Spider-Man Far From Home's main theme is perception. The global perception of Iron Man has shaped what S.H.I.E.L.D. and the general public expect of Spider-Man. There's a preconception of him being a new Iron Man, and Iron Boy Jr. if you like. Nick Fury feeds into this. He expects Spider-Man to be like Iron Man and constantly leverages Tony's faith in him against him. Mysterio feeds into that as his facade is being everything the public perceptions of Iron Man are. That messianic savior who is everything the world in this universe expects Spider-Man to be. And with Stark being this very public figure, naturally the perceptions of Iron Man are going to influence how Peter reflects on Iron Man and in turn himself. Happy serves as the reality check, the one who was actually close with Iron Man, the one who truly knew him. In Spider-Man Far From Home, Spider-Man has to set aside the preconceived notion of him being the final Avenger, the new Iron Man, and break the mold to prove himself that Spider-Man is more than enough in a post-endgame world. If Peter's arc in Spider-Man Homecoming was all about discovering the kind of hero he needed to be, being the friendly neighborhood Spider-Man, Peter's arc in Far From Home involves the entire world telling him, no, he needs to be more than that, when he can't just effortlessly be the savior of the world. He can't necessarily fend off an entire Chitauri fleet, and that's simply because neither could Iron Man. It's a balancing of the scales. It's Spider-Man collapsing under the weight of a legacy that was never his, but it's a legacy that Iron Man himself would also collapse under. So I'll say this, I can understand some folks might not want Iron Man to be central to the themes of a Spider-Man movie. It doesn't bother me personally, I can't find anything objectively wrong with that. This series takes place in the MCU, so it stands to reason that there'd be certain ties and thematic crossover between Spidey and his allies in this world. And I think Spider-Man Far From Home ends that arc in a way that absolutely honors Spider-Man and his own legacy as he blazes his own trail. I think there are a lot of arguments that seem to miss the point of what this film was trying to express for this character. The Iron Boy Jr. arguments are often in full force when it comes to Spider-Man Far From Home, and I'll be real, I just don't get it. I feel like Far From Home completely put that to bed in the same way Homecoming did, but at the same time, with how fast this movie moves, I can't entirely blame people for missing or glossing over certain details. I honestly really enjoy the arc revolving around Spider-Man's feelings of inadequacy, feeling like he needs to live up to the legacy of those he's associated with. It's something I myself can relate to as a YouTuber who's regularly collaborated with YouTubers that have achieved more than I have. YouTubers that I'm commonly associated with. I see their high quality content, their larger subscriber numbers, and I think, yeah, they must have it all figured out. I can never be the next game apologist or V-Infuso. I can never live up to them. And heck, it can be my peers who don't have the numbers I have, but I think their content is higher quality. When really, we're all just as concerned with getting chucked out of this website's merciless algorithm as each other. They too feel dejected when one of their videos doesn't perform as well. They too are their own worst critics. But at the same time, I'll never get my own silver play button by being the next game apologist. I have to do it by being channel pup. But we're all YouTubers at the end of the day. We all edit our videos on computers and so again, two things can be true at once. I'm not V and Fuso, but that doesn't mean we're not alike in various ways. So the message is fundamentally, don't collapse under the weight of someone else's legacy. And in the end, that message is not too dissimilar to Into the Spider-Verse. What makes you different is what makes you Spider-Man. Sure, Iron Man is central to the theme of the film, but it's all in service of Peter Parker. Again, it's quite a complex movie that embraces the concept that two things can be true at once. I understand why people might not like this movie. Maybe the arcs feel too similar to last time, fair enough. Maybe you'd rather have something with more ties to Spidey's origins, fair enough. Maybe the MCU feels intrusive to Spidey, fair enough. There's a lot of different perspectives, but I think to be truly fair on this film, you've got to be willing to leave your preconceived notions of Spidey at the door, because that's a major theme in this film. It's Spidey breaking free of the narratives that surround him, and whatever superficial differences there are between this and whatever version of the source material I most gravitate towards, are ultimately unquantifiable as far as the quality of the film goes. As I say, different doesn't mean bad. My concerns lie more with missed opportunities for character exploration, pacing that doesn't allow for it. 
I can understand the distaste, but I don't understand why some folks act like this film ate their dog in front of them. While there are a few cylinders that just refuse to fire, Spider-Man Far From Home still offers a rip-roaring new adventure for Spidey that builds on the foundations laid down by the excellent Spider-Man Homecoming. It goes much further with its action, spectacle, and thrills, as well as its introspection with Peter Parker. Its shortcomings are absolutely made up for where it steps up the game, and like Homecoming, it's incredibly refreshing, taking a Spidey adventure and setting it in Europe. In the grand scheme of things, Far From Home is distinctive as far as Spider-Man films go. It's probably the least archetypal Spider-Man film to date, which is why I think for some folks, it's the worst one, but for me, it's a very exciting story. I know back in 2019, I used to just gush about this film, and I'm absolutely trying to be fair on it this time, and sometimes being fair means being more critical, but I just can't not love this film. The characters are too endearing, the villain is too menacing, the action is too thrilling, it's incredibly charming, and I just don't get how folks can harbor such resentment for such a likable and pretty contained adventure, but I'm not going to try to preach that perspective. Last thing I want to do is misrepresent, and all power to him, different strokes for different folks. Whatever preconceived notions of Spider-Man and what his stories should entail are, I can't view this as anything less than a good film. It's difficult to really compare it or rank it with other Spider-Man movies because it's so unique in so many aspects while staying true to those core components. It is still a Spider-Man film at the end of the day, just a very unique one. I love Spider-Man Far From Home. I think it's a fantastic film. It has its shortcomings. I don't think it is quite as well constructed as Spider-Man Homecoming was, but I also think it goes a little deeper than Spider-Man Homecoming. I think it tries to do a little more than Spider-Man Homecoming, which is why I generally say I still think it's the better film, even if it's just a little more sloppy in the construction department. Before we wrap up, I do want to talk a little about the extended cut. This version has an expanded first act, as before Peter flies out to Europe, we see him pawning off some of his possessions to be able to afford the trip. We see him working through his to-do list as he picks up his new passport and takes down the Manfredi crime family equipped with his Iron Spider suit. Then just before the final battle, we get a scene of Mysterio informing Nick Fury that there's another elemental on its way to London. The extended cut feels just a little bit more complete. Seeing Peter pawning off his possessions to afford the trip is great. It just adds that little extra context to this story, tells us just that little bit more about the character as opposed to us relying on Civil War, a completely different film, portraying him as a dumpster diver. The scene where Spidey stops the Manfredi crime family as well is just a lot of fun. I can give or take the Mysterio scene. Not much info is really lost. The theatrical cut of Spider-Man Far From Home still flows just fine without these scenes, but I think having all this in there just makes the movie that bit better and remedies the pacing issues even if it doesn't outright fix them. Sadly, there was no home release of the extended cut, however the additional scenes in the first act were compiled into a short film, a midquel called To Do List. And alright, it's a means of watching these scenes, but I definitely prefer a complete extended cut. Ah well, when a studio wants to milk the box office, it makes sense that nickel and dime a few scenes. The basic cut is still fine, and at least we can see those deleted scenes. I'm just not big on the business practice of trimming off a few cuts of meat for an extended release. Summer 2019. Spider-Man Far From Home releases as the very first Spider-Man film to make it into the Billion Dollar Club. A critical and commercial hit making Sony Pictures and Marvel Studios' collaborative efforts on a new Spider-Man for the MCU a huge success. So naturally, on August 20th, the collaborative deal between Sony Pictures and Disney fell through and Spider-Man was withdrawn from the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Wait, hang on, what? Spider-Man! This was surely some kind of massive hoax, I thought. But then, reputable sources started reporting on the news, as well as public statements from Sony. Yep, this was really happening. So, 
The existing deal was two solo movies, three MCU appearances. When it comes to solo films, Sony Pictures finance the films, Disney get 5% of the film's profits, and all revenue from the merchandising. This would mean that Disney were at liberty to use Spider-Man in Marvel crossovers. This worked out quite nicely for both parties, but when it came time to renew the collaborative deal, Disney wanted to make changes. A co-financing offer in return for a 50% box office split between the two studios. Now, I'm no accountant, nor do I have industry insider knowledge, but let's say Spider-Man Far From Home's box office profits were split 50-50 between Disney and Sony. Spider-Man Far From Home made $1.132 billion at the box office. Take 5% off of that, 56,600,000 goes to Marvel Studios, meaning that Sony get 1,075,400,000. But if you were to split it 50-50, both parties would take home $566 million. Now, let's keep in mind, Sony are in a very different financial standing to Disney. A big part of the reason why they made the deal with Disney in the first place was because Sony's financial footing wasn't great, and Spider-Man as their biggest cash cow wasn't making them enough money. Evidence of this being The Amazing Spider-Man 2's box office underperformance. Now, The Amazing Spider-Man 2 made $709 million at the box office. So, if they were to opt into the 50-50 split, Sony would be making $143 million less than their worst performing Spider-Man movie that they made all by themselves. Now from what we understand, Disney were not willing to budge on this. And so, the news outlets were reporting that Sony had made the decision to withdraw Spider-Man from the Marvel Cinematic Universe. To say that this announcement caused backlash for Sony would be an understatement. See, if I'm being completely honest, looking back, Sony were in the right to refuse that revised version of the deal. Looking at this from a business standpoint, that would negate the entire reason why Sony ever even started the collaborative deal with Disney. At this time, in wake of this news, various Marvel Studios alumni pitched in their thoughts on Spider-Man departing the MCU. The Russo brothers expressing a more bittersweet take that Sony are now one less thing for Kevin Feige to worry about in terms of management of the already massive Marvel Cinematic Universe. Paul Bettany and Elizabeth Olsen would lament Spidey's departure, and I think Ben Mendelsohn, who played Talos, put it perfectly, and I quote, But shit, man, you can't lose Spider-Man from the Marvel Universe. He's one of their absolute motherfucking porn stars. Boy, I could name 30 superheroes that you could comfortably lose before you start thinking about losing Spider-Man. In fact, I cannot think of a single character who's more important to Marvel than Spider-Man. You've got Hulk, you've got Thor, none of them are as important as Spider-Man. None of them. Losing him would be a disaster. <laughs> Hell yeah, Ben Mendelsohn bloody gets it. That being said, the best thing to come from this entire ordeal was easily Jeff Goldblum's response. Speaking of Kevin, we're, we're talking about Kevin in the MCU a lot right now in the news, keeping him with Spider-Man. Why, why do you think Spider-Man is such an important part of the MCU? Because there may be a little divorce happening. No, this is the first I've heard of it. Save Spider-Man? Uh I'm crestfallen. S -s 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 Save. What's happening? I didn't know any of this. So Sony and Marvel are having a hard time coming to terms on the agreement to co-produce Spider-Man. So it's looking like Spider-Man may go back to Sony and not be part of the MCU anymore. Uh, I, I'm not a business person. You're speaking. Whatever you say is Greek to me. But to all these, the mountains of and uh, and uh, I don't know. It'll all work out. I'm sure. Uh, good luck. Uh, I'll figure it out. Well, as the milkmaid said when she kissed her cow, the show must go on. And so, Sony Pictures would begin work on the new Spider-Man 3, with Tom Holland returning to the role of Spider-Man. Far From Home writers Chris McKenna and Eric Summers would be returning to pen the script, and Sony were teasing a big team-up with another Marvel superhero. Presumably, I think they meant Venom. They've been wanting a Spider-Man and Venom crossover for the longest time, and the opportunity was absolutely there now without Marvel Studios. Plus, I mean, how many other Marvel heroes does Sony even have? The only member of their own universe that established at that point was Venom. Sony Pictures chairman Tom Rothman would be taking the lead producer role on Spider-Man projects going forward. Tom Rothman is pretty infamous for poor decision-making and interfering with production. For reference, 
This man rejected Avatar because he thought it would never sell. Based on public knowledge, this is also the man responsible for Deadpool being portrayed the way he was in X-Men Origins Wolverine and stood in the way of Ryan Reynolds' efforts to get a proper Deadpool off the ground. It was looking like Tom Holland's Spider-Man 3 could have gone in a few different directions, but was looking to keep the same overall spirit of Spider-Man Homecoming and Far From Home, just without any ties to the MCU. I do think that, with the right management, <coughs> not Tom Rothman, Sony could have been a real contender with Spider-Man all to themselves. This was a post-Avengers Endgame world. Marvel Studios would no longer have Iron Man and Captain America in their arsenal, and now no Spider-Man? I do think that Sony would have had an advantage if they could pull it off. That is something to say for hypothetical scenarios though, as it was reported in September of 2019 that Disney and Sony have finally patched things up and reached an agreement and that Spider-Man would continue in the MCU, all with a brand new deal. What did this new deal consist of? Well, details of what the new deal includes are a little more vague this time, however, it was clear that there would be at least one more MCU Spider-Man film and one more MCU crossover in store for Spidey, with Disney receiving 25% of the box office profits as opposed to the originally proposed 50, all while co-financing the films. And then in December of 2019, Tom Holland would tell Jimmy Kimmel that he emailed Bob Iger to thank him for his time as Spider-Man during the split and to express that he was upset about Disney and Sony not being able to come to an agreement. Bob Iger would later call the drunk and emotional Tom Holland, and before you judge, relax, he was at a pub quiz with his family. According to Bob Iger, Holland begged him to try to figure out something with Sony to ensure Spidey's future in the MCU. Iger promised Holland that he'd try. Tom Holland, now lauded by fans as the one who saved Spider-Man. Now guys, I hate to be the one to tell you that the Easter Bunny isn't real, but I don't think any of that happened at all. See, Tom Holland has a reputation for being a bit of a fanboy of the movies he's in, unable to resist spilling the beans on what fans can expect because he's just that excited. And that's because he's just like you. He's a fan, and he was the one who did the legwork to guarantee Spider-Man would return for the MCU. For the fans. Now, let me throw this out there. Public relations. It's good for any movie's publicity for the audience to be on good terms with the star, to feel a sense of kinship, no matter how nonsensical, distant, or parasocial that may be. If any actor were to reveal anything they weren't supposed to, that'd be a breach of their contract and incur legal action. Tom Holland will reveal what he's allowed to reveal all in service of the fanboy who is just like you, just in service of that image, and I'll eat a shoe if it turns out that this story about him calling up Bob Iger, begging him to reconsider for the fans, is not just in service of public relations. And then of course, there's Bob Iger too. Oh, the lovable CEO who, who thought of the fans, who, who listened to his star. We can always count on the CEO of the multi-billion dollar corporation to think about us, the little people. Nah, sorry, bullshit. I don't believe for a second that the story of Tom Holland and Bob Iger in a phone call with Tom Holland begging him to think of the fans was anything more than a public relations stunt. In fact, I think Disney had a very different strategy. See, all of this went very public very fast. Sometimes deals and agreements fall through and further arrangements are made to revisit the table and this all goes on in private and we don't hear about it. But let's not forget how many news outlets Disney have in their back pocket. I firmly believe that Disney used this as a bargaining chip to show Sony how badly they needed to maintain this partnership and how much damage it would do to their public image if they were to withdraw Spider-Man. Even if they were fully within their rights to turn down the 50-50 deal, it was an assertion that Sony were incapable of pleasing the fans with the IP they bought the licenses to fair and square. Heh, <laughs> you think a company like Disney gets to where it does without a bit of corporate bullying? Nevertheless, a deal was struck, and MCU Spider-Man 3 was on its way very soon. Or maybe not that soon, because the entire world shut down for two years. God, th this is a weird story, isn't it? Spider-Man No Way Home is unique. 
It's the only Spider-Man film to be shot in the midst of a global pandemic, meaning that different measures had to be taken for this one to avoid transmission of the virus, including much more indoor shoots, more studio stuff, less crowd scenes, less actors on screen at any one time. This also caused a great deal of disruption and delays for the film, not to mention the pandemic causing Marvel Studios to reshuffle their entire Phase 4 slate, meaning that Spider-Man No Way Home would undergo various script changes late into production to ensure cohesion with the rest of the Phase 4 slate. So nobody could have predicted what kind of form Spider-Man No Way Home would take. What does a mid-pandemic Spider-Man movie look like? Would it be worth the wait? Would it have been able to reach the box office highs of its predecessor with everyone scared to go outside? Well, Marvel and Sony were pulling out all of the stops for Spider-Man No Way Home, as a slew of returning actors from the Sam Raimi Spider-Man trilogy and the Mark Webb duology would be reprising their roles as villains for this film, coinciding with the multiverse saga built up early in Phase 4. This, of course, would stir fan speculation that we'd finally see Tom Holland alongside Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield's Spider-Man. Now, I was constantly trying to think outside the box in the lead-up to Spider-Man No Way Home, refusing to take a live-action Spider-Verse for granted, only to be let down when that doesn't materialize. I considered that this may be just a piece of meta-casting, like with Evan Peters in WandaVision or J.K. Simmons as J. Jonah Jameson. Maybe these would be new versions with the same actors, but as time went by and trailers were released, at the last minute might I add, it became clear that no, these were the versions from the Raimi and Webb series, and they were back just as we remembered them. Except for Electro, but more on him later. So it stood to reason we'd be seeing the Spider-Man 2, right? Well, they kept their return as under wraps as possible, save for a couple of leaks which were becoming harder and harder to deny. Look closely at Tobey Maguire's dick. Five villains were confirmed, Green Goblin, Doc Ock, Sandman, Lizard, and Electro. Surely, this was it, a multiversal Sinister Six. But who was the sixth member? Surely they weren't just keeping Paul Giamatti's Rhino under wraps. Maybe Venom? Maybe the Spider-Man 3 version of Venom? What if it's Mysterio, back from the dead? I'd say the anticipation for Spider-Man No Way Home was ridiculous, but it cannot be understated how exciting this was to see 20 years of Spider-Man film history all coming together for the third MCU Spider-Man film. But wait, hang on. At the end of Spider-Man Far From Home, we saw Peter's secret identity revealed to the world by Mysterio. That seems like an awfully big deal to just shove aside in favor of a multiverse fan service movie, doesn't it? How is any of this gonna melt? With so many toys in his box, Spider-Man No Way Home was going to be a very packed movie. So, December 17th, 2021 rolls around. How does Spider-Man No Way Home shape up? Taking place immediately after Spider-Man Far From Home, Mysterio has just framed Spider-Man and revealed his secret identity to the world. Peter's life is now in tatters as he and MJ try to swing to refuge only to be spotted by literally everyone everywhere at all times. <laughs> Good movie that. So the opening of this film is incredibly strong with Spidey and MJ swinging back to Aunt May's for refuge. So there's this little detail with the web swinging that was also present in Far From Home, but I just want to talk about it here. I love this close-up flying camera sort of deal they have going on with the scenes of MJ and Spidey swinging together. It means that rather than web swinging sequences just being purely CGI, there is some practical work going on here, which gives a nice sense of tangibility. We follow this up with a one-shot as Peter and MJ arrive home, and it's pure chaos in the Parker household. May and Happy Summer Fling has come to an end, helicopters surround the apartment. There's a lot of great characterization in this sequence. A small detail I love is when Spidey's helping MJ into the apartment window, and he accidentally touches a butt and immediately apologizes. It's such a small detail, and they don't linger on it thankfully, as the MCU does have a bit of a tendency with over-telegraphing gags, but it's just this very brief moment that contributes to the characterization of this very polite Peter Parker. So, it's all over the news. The drones that attacked London were Stark drones. Damage control entered the Parker household to seize the Iron Spider charging bay, the Edith glasses, and any other Stark tech they can find, and take Peter, Aunt May, Ned, and MJ into custody for interrogation. 
Fortunately, Matt Murdock, aka Daredevil, helps Team Peter to avoid legal repercussions, as there is insufficient evidence that Peter was responsible for the attack on London. However, the public are divided, with some believing in Mysterio and others believing in Spider-Man. With the Parker household address now being public knowledge, Happy gives the Parkers a new place to live in his condominium. I like that we get a little time to let the consequences of the identity reveal really sink in. Peter heads to school after the reveal of his secret identity. It's here where we get presumably the final appearance of teachers Mr. Harrington and Mr. Dell, who are doing everything they can to be supportive of Peter and his powers. It's honestly wholesome. Flash is taking advantage of the entire situation, selling books about how he's Spidey's best friend, and crowds surround Midtown High as Peter enters the school. This is all great stuff. Living publicly as Spider-Man would be pretty unlivable for an ordinary teenager who has to go to school every day. And with high school graduation approaching, all of the students are looking to get into the top colleges, with Peter, MJ, and Ned's sights set on MIT. Sadly, Peter doesn't get accepted into any of the colleges he applied to because of the controversy surrounding him as Spider-Man. But the same goes for MJ and Ned due to their affiliations. Flash, on the other hand, gets in. Now, this is a bit bizarre. Flash has been the most public about his affiliations with Spider-Man, going so far as to publish a book about it, yet he gets into MIT while Ned and MJ don't due to affiliations with Spider-Man. Huh? Now, maybe his parents paid off admissions, maybe nobody believes him. Just a little line of dialogue or something to fix that inconsistency would have gone a long way, and it is ultimately a throwaway moment that doesn't hold a huge amount of bearing on the film. Actually, wait, yes it does, because Peter asks Flash where the admissions lady is. Damn it, it's kind of sloppy, guys. Now, it's bad enough that Peter's life is ruined by Mysterio, but he feels responsible for Ned and MJ missing out on their opportunities. So he goes to Doctor Strange asking him if he can turn back time and prevent Mysterio from revealing his identity. Obviously though, the Time Stone is no longer inside of the Eye of Agamotto, so that isn't possible. Instead, Strange offers to wipe all memory of Peter being Spider-Man, which Peter accepts. However, mid-spell, he starts asking Doctor Strange to make a missions. MJ, Ned, Happy, Aunt May, all people who benefited from knowing Spidey's secret identity should all continue to know. But because Peter keeps asking for these alterations mid-spell, it causes the spell to grow unstable, and so Doctor Strange has to do what he can to contain the spell and abort, containing it all in this little trigger box. Now, welcome back to another episode of MCU Spider-Man Contrived Moments. Doctor Strange is effectively offering to brainwash the entire world. You mean to tell me that these two would not have discussed the potential repercussions and consequences? Who shouldn't shouldn't still know? I can understand Spider-Man not thinking too straight in this moment. He's trying to piece his life back together, as well as the lives of his friends while he's at an absolute low point. Although I will say he skirts the line of being a little too oblivious when the entire room is literally collapsing around him and he's still making requests. Doctor Strange though, he definitely should have spoken to Peter about the consequences of the spell beforehand. Let me guess, is he a scroll too? So Doctor Strange realizes that Peter never spoke to MIT admissions to plead his case before coming to him for help, so he shoves him out of the door. Peter goes to contact the assistant vice chancellor as she's on her way to the airport. Now earlier in the film, during a montage, Peter's new red and black suit was stained after a paint attack from a protester, so he rocks up in what's left of his iron spider suit with drastically reduced functionality due to the Stark tech being confiscated. He completely bungles his attempt at pleading his case to the vice chancellor. The awkwardness is interrupted, however, by an attack on the bridge. Doc Ock is back, once again played by Alfred Molina. Confused and transported out of his own world, he references the events of Spider-Man 2, asking Spidey where his artificial son has gone. Now, this showdown between our new Peter Parker and Doc Ock does have a lot to live up to, as the fight scenes between Spider-Man and Doc Ock in Spider-Man 2 are still some of the best action sequences in the genre to this day. I'll say this, while it isn't my favorite action sequence between these two, it's a worthy follow-up. John Watts nails the brute force of Ock's tentacles. Easily my favorite part of this scene is when Ock has Spidey suspended in the air and uses his tentacles to pull the Daily Bugle helicopter blades to Spidey in an attempt to slice him to bits. 
I'm not sure how deliberate it is, but it feels like there's also a lot of references to the bridge scene in The Amazing Spider-Man 1, as Ock throws cars off the side of the bridge, which Spidey has to web up, with him rescuing the Vice Chancellor as she dangles over the train tracks. Now, as much as I feel the Iron Spider suit is becoming overused in the MCU, it is kind of worth it here just so we could see Ock battle against Spider-Man, with Spidey having his own set of mechanical arms. I also like how when Ock steals some of the nanotech that forms the Iron Spider, the suit sends the nanotech to the parts of his body that need protection, leading to Peter unmasking in front of Otto, the two equally confused by the situation. Of course, Ock has made a fatal error, as now that his tentacles are augmented by Peter's nanotech, Peter can control them. I'm gonna say this, it's a bummer that Doc Ock was defeated as soon as he was. I'd love to have seen what he could have done with that nanotech, how they'd enhance his tentacles, but alas, that's left to our imagination. After being rescued, inspired by his heroics, the Vice Chancellor tells Peter she'll talk to admissions about Ned and MJ, but also Peter. Ock is now defeated, as Peter has complete control over his mechanized arms, but the battle on the bridge isn't over yet, as the bridge is bombed, and from the smoke emerges Spider-Man's oldest foe. Just not this Spider-Man. The Green Goblin, as played by Willem Dafoe, is back. However, before he has the chance to strike, Doctor Strange transports Spider-Man to the Undercroft, where he's trapped Doc Ock and the Lizard. Strange explains to Peter that the botched spell has started bringing in everyone who knows Peter Parker is Spider-Man from other universes into this one. Now, I do love the interactions between Ock and Strange. See, the Raimi universe was generally a bit more grounded than the MCU. We didn't have cosmic or mystical entities in there, and Octavius is, of course, a renowned scientist, so he's pretty dumbfounded by Doctor Strange and his talk of magic. I also love Peter and Strange's dynamic. Peter being a naive kid and Strange just wanting Peter out of his hair to put a stop to everything. However, I can't help but find Doctor Strange to come across as just a bit petulant and hypocritical. I'd argue that he's equally responsible for what's going on here, given that at no point did he ever discuss the potential repercussions of the spell with Peter. MJ actually does call him out on this, so okay, it does seem intentional, but it's a little out of character for Doctor Strange. But then we have an absolutely massive plot hole. Like, massive. Doc Ock knows that Norman Osborn was the Green Goblin. But how? This wasn't public knowledge in the Raimi universe. In Spider-Man 2, everyone talks about Norman with affection and fondness. Absolutely no mention whatsoever of him being the Green Goblin. Tobey Maguire's Peter Parker would never let Harry know that his father was the Green Goblin, to the detriment of their own friendship. He let Harry believe Spider-Man just randomly killed his father to preserve that secret. So how does Otto know? Was he a confidant? Why did he keep it a secret? This was definitely not public knowledge during the time of Spider-Man 2, that is for sure. So what the hell, movie? So Strange has Peter, Ned, and MJ track down the multiversals as he provides Peter with a mystically augmented web shooter that would transport his enemies back to the Undercroft. There's a fun scene of Peter, MJ, and Ned exploring the Undercroft, seeing all the strange things Doctor Strange has in his basement. This is what MCU Spider-Man is all about in a lot of ways, exploring the Marvel Universe through the eyes of ordinary kids. So Spidey flips his stain suit inside out, which surely isn't a great idea because that exposes the copper wiring and circuitry of the suit, so one rough landing and the functionality of the suit would surely be buggered, but I guess it's magical Stark tech that can withstand being submerged in water, so maybe it's cool, but seeing how much exposed wiring is in there, it cannot be comfortable to wear. And anyways, he flips his stain suit inside out, puts it on, and he sets out to track down the Green Goblin in the woods, but he's instead met with Electro, played by Jamie Foxx. It was nice to, albeit briefly, see his blue form and hear his iconic theme one last time before the battle starts. But Spidey is protected by the Sandman, and the two work together to cut the power and take down Electro. Now, because energy and electricity works differently in this universe, Electro manifests differently, no longer glowing blue, instead being a lot more recognizable as Jamie Foxx. However, Sandman is seemingly stuck permanently in his sand form, which isn't really acknowledged, but I guess you could say same logic applies, the elements work differently in this dimension, so these characters manifest differently. When Spidey transports Electro to the Undercroft, Sandman grows paranoid thinking Spider-Man may have just killed him, 
so he transports him to the Undercroft too. So as much as I enjoy this scene, there are a few things that strike me as bizarre. For one, Electro never found out who Spider-Man was in The Amazing Spider-Man 2, and it's never acknowledged that he may have found out off-screen either. Not only that, but it's just a little odd to me how Sandman is characterized here too. He thinks MCU Peter is the Peter from his universe at first, but the way he talks to him is like he's an old family friend as opposed to the man who, albeit accidentally, killed Uncle Ben. Alright, so back at the Undercroft, we've got four of the villains now trapped, and I gotta say, we almost never see Spider-Man villains interact with each other, so it's great to see here. But again, there are some bizarre decisions going on. See, in Spider-Man 2, it's mentioned that Doc Ock was close friends with the Dr. Connors of his world. So why does he have absolutely no reaction to Electro revealing that the Lizard was formerly Kurt Connors? But then also, we have Electro, and no way, no. This is not the same character from The Amazing Spider-Man 2. Remember how I said in my review of Amazing 2, Jamie Foxx, an effortlessly cool dude, has absolutely no business playing an aggressively dorky guy? Well, Spider-Man No Way Home seems to agree with me, as this guy here is absolutely nothing like his Amazing Spider-Man 2 counterpart. He's not dorky, he's not as over-the-top Schumacher-esque as his Amazing Spider-Man to Electro counterpart either. He's a bit more like Jamie Foxx this time. Perhaps what I said about electricity changing his brain chemistry could apply here, but that was always a suggestion. While Sandman wants to get home to Penny, Electro is loving it in the MCU. And all the weirdness of Doctor Strange's Undercroft, the new energy, his new form. I like that kind of polar opposite character dynamic we've got between Electro and Sandman. So Spidey spends the remainder of the night repairing the damages to the power lines while Norman battles the voice in his head, establishing that Norman himself is not fundamentally the Green Goblin, he just suffers from a Jekyll and Hyde situation with the Goblin. May calls Peter to let him know that Norman is at the feast shelter and Spidey rushes over only to find that Norman is more sick than evil, not really a threat in his current state. Peter suggests that he just needs to send Norman and all of the other enemies home as soon as possible, but Aunt May tells Peter that he should take responsibility and help these new multiversal guests before sending them home. Peter asserts though that their best chances at rehabilitation are back in their own dimension. This interaction also nixes any chance of seeing a Green Goblin that belongs to this universe, as Norman states that Oscorp doesn't exist in this world. So, that's a bit of a bummer, but hey, I'm fine with Defoe being the quintessential Green Goblin to the movie Spider-Man universe. I don't think anyone can nail this role the way he does. I also love the little homage to Gobby's classic look here, as he's wearing green pajamas over a purple hoodie. So May finally gets the paint stains out of the Spidey suit and takes Spidey and Norman to the Sanctum Sanctorum. There's a small interaction here that I really like. When Peter introduces Norman to MJ and Ned, he asks if MJ stands for Mary Jane, to which MJ responds, Michelle Jones. I feel like this is both an acknowledgement and an assertion. That this isn't the Raimi trilogy, this isn't the comics, these are different characters and a different world that MCU Spider-Man inhabits, all while retaining the core fundamentals of a Spider-Man story. I'm a-okay with that. It's an acknowledgement that the classics are valid, the character of Mary Jane still matters, but this is Michelle Jones. Ned then asks if there could be another Ned Leeds. Now, this could either be a joke about how, no, there are no other Neds in the universes that we've seen here, or it's a reference to the Ned Leeds of the comics being the Hobgoblin, but it works on kind of two different levels. So we then double down on the plot hole from earlier, as Doc Ock tells Norman that he died years ago, and then Sandman comes in to really double down on the double downing, saying it was all over the news that Norman Osborn was killed by the glider he flew around on. But that doesn't make any sense! Guys! Guys! Writers, hello! Did you watch the Raimi trilogy? It was never public knowledge! This isn't just a little plot hole. This was integral to the core conflict of the Raimi trilogy. Peter allowed Harry to live in the belief that Norman was this wonderful perfect man and a great father that Spider-Man just killed one day. Other people in this world weren't just humoring Harry. Peter kept it completely secret to his own detriment. He made that sacrifice. If it was all over the news, what, did everyone just conveniently keep hush about it? Did Harry just conveniently have his back turned to every newspaper, every TV screen, every news outlet? Heck. Otto worked closely with Harry. 
Would he have never mentioned it, asked about it? To say it was all over the news and was just public knowledge completely dismantles and undermines the entire crux, the entire basis of the conflict between Peter and Harry, which was the main conflict of the entire trilogy. How do you mess that up? Now I guess you could say, okay, Sandman survived past Harry's death. Maybe when Harry died, Bernard finally spoke out publicly, and then it was all over the news. But Doc Ock died before any of that happened, yet he knows. There are only two ways this can work. One, Ock was a confidant of Norman, but that's never mentioned in any way, and there's no evidence at all to suggest that. Two, this is Ock not from the Prime Raimi universe, but instead a variant from a Raimi adjacent universe. The same would then either have to go for Sandman, or like I said, Bernard eventually spoke out after Harry's death. The variant theory would also explain how he got that nice turtleneck on beneath his harness, which is very tasteful by the way. The thing is, that's not referenced or acknowledged in the film. And I am personally of the belief that if a plot hole can only be filled using the audience's imagination or head cannons, and that's just the audience doing the work for the writers, and that's indicative of lazy writing. If the plot hole can be filled using evidence from the film itself, then it's less egregious. This doesn't ruin the film for me. I'm willing to use my imagination, but it does beg a belief how a few lines of dialogue could completely undercut one of the most important aspects of a trilogy which this film goes out of its way to connect with. So at this point it becomes clear that almost all of these villains were definitely going to die before they were transported into the MCU. So when Doctor Strange goes to send them home using his trigger box, Peter instead acts on Aunt May's wishes to rehabilitate the new foes. So we get a fight between Spider-Man and Doctor Strange, and it's a tremendous scene that makes use of a lot of Doctor Strange's abilities as he astral projects Spider-Man out of his own body, and we see that the spider sense still works and prevents Doctor Strange from getting the upper hand. Spider-Man is just that tough, he's a unit. When Spidey tries to get away with the trigger box, Strange battles him in the mirror dimension where he controls all of the rules of how that world works. It's a thrilling sequence as Spider-Man is swinging through this kaleidoscoped version of Manhattan which eventually transports to the Grand Canyon. The visuals are psychedelic and it's just awesome to see Spider-Man in such a stylized abstract environment. Spidey eventually gains the upper hand as he realizes that the mirror dimension is based entirely on geography so he uses his ingenuity and knowledge of geography to escape and trap Doctor Strange in the mirror dimension. But not before stealing the sling ring to ensure that Doctor Strange won't be able to get out. So wait, how does he intend on getting Doctor Strange out of there? Is he just gonna wait for Wong to come back or what? Okay, so we know the webs dissolve in two hours and Doctor Strange controls that world, so he's not necessarily gonna plummet to his death. But I really hope there's like a McDonald's in there or something, because man's gotta eat, right? I'll say this, I really do appreciate the dichotomy between Spidey and Doctor Strange as heroes. Spidey's idealism, his desire to ensure all of the villains get home safe, while Doctor Strange is far more of a realist, prioritizing the grand calculus of the multiverse. A bit more utilitarian in that sense. So the villains reluctantly agree to join Spider-Man in going to Happy's apartment so he can use Stark Tech to cure them. So there is one small detail I wanted to briefly mention. The Lizard choosing to stay in the truck. Spidey is surely aware that the Lizard can escape the truck easily, right? But I'm almost kind of chill about this one, as it feels more like an open admission that they just didn't have the budget to render the lizard into these scenes, or find a place for him here. I don't know, I'm kind of just inclined to forgive that one. That said, I do like how much time we get for these villains, who have never interacted before, to just kind of hang out, I guess. We do get an incredibly unfunny joke with Aunt May offering Doc Ock tap water or salt water, because, and I quote, You're an octopus. It's just, it's such a reach. So Peter and Norman use the Stark tech to create a new inhibitor chip for Otto. The following scene where Otto is cured is an absolutely wonderful scene, as Otto for the first time in a very long time finally gets some peace in his head. Alfred Molina does a terrific job selling that this is a man who has just found peace when he thought he'd never know peace ever again. Ock gives back the nanotech he stole and infuses it with Spidey's suit, creating the integrated suit. 
just the basic upgraded spidey suit, but now with a little bit of metal reinforcement in the form of a massive gold spider on the chest. I love the scene where our newly reformed Otto excitedly goes to Norman to ask him how it feels to know he's going to be whole again soon. These two do seem like friends, so perhaps I can believe that he'd be a confident to not- No! No, we cannot be so charitable! A plot hole's a plot hole, damn it! So Peter's been working on cures for Electro and Norman too, but Electro is hesitant to let Peter help. He loves the power he has, which is a nice juxtaposition between him and, say, Norman who's tortured by his power, or Ock who was in misery. We also get a brilliant portrayal of the spider sense as the angle on the camera switches to a much wider one and tracks Peter at a front-on angle while he surveys the room. And anyone with any kind of spider sense of their own can see what this is going to be about. Norman has turned. Goblin mode. It's nice to see that even beyond the Raimi-verse, <laughs> Green Goblin is incredibly quotable with lines like, Norman's on sabbatical, honey, and strong enough to have it all, too weak to take it. Electro refuses his cure and escapes, as well as Lizard and Sandman. Ock is knocked out of the building by Electro. The fight between Spidey and Goblin here is brilliant, visceral, violent. It's easily the most brutal fight scene for the MCU Spider-Man yet, as Goblin just bodies poor old Peter Parker without any weaponry or his glider. It's just a fist fight, and Willem Dafoe is on absolute top form. Zero restraint in this performance here. Now, I would have absolutely criticized the fact that there's a magical box plot device that can just create all the cures for these villains, but that's actually not the case, as Aunt May tries to administer the Goblin cure by force, only for it to not work. Goblin summons his glider, hitting Aunt May, and bombs the place. Spidey and Aunt May try to get away as the SWAT team surround the building ready to shoot at Spider-Man, but Aunt May needs a moment to catch her breath and get her bearings. Spidey laments not sending the villains home, but Aunt May tells him that with great power there must also come great responsibility. Now, does that negate the possibility that Uncle Ben already taught Peter this? Not necessarily. As Peter responds by telling her, he knows. But also at this point, given that this film is bringing all the different Spider-Man universes together while going out of its way to highlight the differences between this new version and previous incarnations, I guess it's not too big of a stretch to suggest that maybe Uncle Ben just didn't serve that same purpose in this universe, and that instead, Aunt May takes that position. Be an interesting way of bringing new definitions to those core Spidey traits, and utilizing the fact we never explicitly saw Spidey's origins this time. It's different, but I can get behind it. Anyways, Aunt May collapses, dying in Peter's arms. The SWAT team are shooting at Spidey. Happy is driven back to see his home in ruins, and his love dead. And he yells for Peter to just run. Once again, John Watts is excellent at tense scenes. The music swells as Peter has to force himself away from Aunt May as the SWAT team close in as Happy's yelling for Peter to just run. It's absolutely tremendous, and the shot we end this scene on? A shot of Aunt May's face as a tear rolls down her cheek. Now that is uncompromising. From this point on, the film takes a very different tone. We get a terrific scene as Peter watches J. Jonah Jameson blame the incident on him on one of the giant screens in Times Square as the rain falls down his face. It's such a textured scene. The cinematography here is incredible. These shots are gorgeous. This is uncompromising storytelling right here. So back at Ned's Nana Lola's house, Ned and MJ watch the news of what happened at the condo. Ned attempts to summon a portal to Peter so they can see him, but accidentally summons a portal to a different Peter, a different Spider-Man. Welcome to the MCU, Andrew Garfield, the amazing Spider-Man. I love how this scene is set up. I know that there are people that are very critical of the entry of the other Spider-Men, as they were hoping for something big and dramatic with a ton of fanfare. But this isn't a Spider-Verse movie. This is not about Andrew Garfield and Tobey Maguire. This is MCU Spider-Man 3, and this other Spider-Man here is a supporting cast member. I love how you at first see him in the distance, noticeably leaner, and it's like, is that? It could be. And then he comes running into the frame where it becomes clear that this is our long-lost amazing Spider-Pal. Andrew Garfield is incredibly charming in this role as he tries to convince Ned and MJ that he is Peter Parker 
just of another dimension. I love his dynamic with MJ here, as she has him crawl around to prove that he's Spider-Man and throws bread at him to try to trigger the spider sense. Realizing that this isn't there, Peter, Ned tries again, only to summon Toby Maguire's Peter Parker in his civilian clothes. It really is funny to me how Andrew Garfield rocks up in the Spider-Man costume, which causes Loda to shriek in terror and MJ to try to force him to prove he's the real Spider-Man, all the while, Tobey Maguire just rocks up in civilian clothes, and Lola's immediately charmed by him, while MJ immediately believes that he is Peter Parker. That's almost kind of like a funny meta joke on the reception of these movies, how Tobey's Spidey is admittedly a lot more beloved, even though Andrew Garfield was undeniably Spider-Man. So the two Peters, Ned and MJ, track MCU Peter down to the roof of Midtown High. Ned and MJ comfort him before the two Peters go in to talk, and they realize that despite their differences, they've all got a lot in common. They've all dealt with losses, losses that they feel responsible for. MCU Peter tells the two Peters that as much as he wants to kill the Green Goblin, Aunt May's last words always ring through. Toby's Peter recognizes these words and completes the sentence, and when MCU Peter asks how they know, Andrew Garfield's Peter tells him that Uncle Ben said that the day he died. Except wait, no he didn't, not in your world, he didn't say that. He said something adjacent to it, but that's not what he said to you, Andrew. With that being said though, I do really love this scene. How Toby and Tom relate to each other, how we learn of what happened to Andrew after the death of Gwen Stacy, how each of these Spideys took a brief trip down the path of darkness before taking responsibility and doing the right thing. I also kind of like how understated MCU Spidey's response to the Uncle Ben mention is. He kind of knows, but he has a very slight facial reaction, you know? It just does make me wonder what kind of role Uncle Ben did play for this version of Spider-Man, as it probably wasn't quite as big of a role as traditionally is portrayed. So the three Peters work together at Midtown High to create cures, each of these Peters wanting some form of closure, wanting to make right the things that went wrong in their lives, Toby wanting a chance to cure Norman, revealing that he's thought about it for a long time, Andrew clearly regretting that he couldn't save Gwen. We also find out how Toby's Peter is now with his respective MJ, despite things being complicated, rendering the unused Spider-Man 4 scripts non-canon, or at least contradicted, or changed, or whatever. I'm okay with this. It's not an ideal outcome for him, and that works. It's complicated. But he and MJ were able to at least make things right. That's a really nice position to put this legacy version of the character in. Andrew also explains how he's already cured the lizard before, and so I quote, It's no big deal. Wait a minute, did they just reference the Sony email leaks? <gasps> Are we gonna see Andrew Garfield doing Tough Mudder in Secret Wars? Ooh! <laughs> and so the Peters head to the Statue of Liberty to cure the villains once and for all, and send them home. With MCU Peter making a public broadcast to the Daily Bugle to lure them in. While they wait, the three Peters discuss their histories, the enemies they've faced, and how Toby doesn't need mechanical web shooters and can shoot webs naturally. Just a little bit of fan service. A portal is open to Ned and MJ for them to take the trigger box away from the villains, but Ned is unable to close the portal, as his previous portals all closed by themselves. He's never had to really do that before. Eventually, the villains rock up, and the three Peters work together to take them down, but without a plan, they're not great at working together. Acknowledging this, MCU Peter uses his experience as an Avenger to lead the other two Peters. He dubs Toby Peter 2 and Andrew Peter 3, and the three swing into the battle, synergized as one by one they cure the villains. The Lizard notices Ned and MJ and enters the portal, chasing them through Midtown until they jump out of the portal and onto the Statue of Liberty, now a part of the battle. They summon Doctor Strange to help out, all while Peter 2 cures Sandman, Peter 1 cures the Lizard, and Doc Ock cures Electro. I love the scenes after the enemies are cured. Peter 2 reassuring Sandman that he's going to get him home, and Peter 1 welcoming Connors back are the weaker ones of the set, as they had to work with existing footage of Thomas Hayden Church and Re-Siphons in their human forms. They couldn't make it to shooting, so they didn't get physical performances, so in their human forms, there's no dialogue between them and the spiders who cure them. However, we do get scenes with Andrew Garfield and Jamie Foxx, as well as Tobey Maguire and Alfred Molina. These scenes of the characters making and finding peace with each other are some of my favorite moments in the film, especially the scene where Otto meets Peter too, 
telling him he's all grown up and how good it is to see him. It almost feels like he was talking to the audience in this moment. So now there's only one enemy left to cure, the Green Goblin, who triggers all three spider senses and attacks the Statue of Liberty. Strange goes to trigger the box only for Peter 1 to notice a pumpkin bomb in there. This blows up the box, reopens the spell, and begins tearing at the dimension, as the cracks appear in the skies above, revealing silhouettes of classic Spider-Man villains, including Kraven, Rhino, Mysterio, and more. Everyone from every dimension who knows Peter Parker is Spider-Man is now converging on the MCU. The explosion of the pumpkin bomb causes MJ to slip. Peter 1 goes to save her, but is taken out by the Green Goblin. He would have been impaled by the glider had it not been for the big metal spider on his chest. This is where Peter 3 gets his shot at redemption, as he rescues MJ, with memories of Gwen still fresh in his head. Peter 1 goes to fight the Green Goblin on the ground of the statue, and it's once again a very violent fight, as Peter absolutely bodies the Green Goblin, while Goblin provokes him constantly. Peter 1 goes in for the kill, taking his glider, ready to impale him, killing him as he was killed before. But he's stopped by Peter 2, who with a look is able to calm Peter 1. Goblin stabs Peter 2, giving Peter 1 another reason, another opening to kill him. But instead, Peter 3 throws him the Goblin Cure, and Peter 1 chooses to cure the Goblin. It is kind of strange though when you think, had Peter 2 not been present, Peter 1 would now be a cold blood murderer. Not entirely sure how to feel about that, but I feel that Peter 2 being stabbed by Gobby served to give Peter 1 another chance at choosing murder. Doctor Strange is unable to stop the multiverses from converging, so Peter goes to him with a solution as to how to send all of the villains home, and everyone home. Erase himself from everyone's memories. Don't just make them forget Peter Parker is Spider-Man, make them forget who Peter Parker even is. And oh look! This time, Doctor Strange actually talks to Peter about the repercussions. Peter agrees to make the sacrifice, and there's a nice moment where Doctor Strange very subtly confesses a profound love and respect for Peter as he says goodbye. Peter goes to thank the two Spideys as the three share a brotherly embrace. Peter then goes to Ned and MJ, promising he'll find them and make them remember, but for now, it's goodbye. Everyone is sent home, and Spidey swings off into the sunrise. We follow that with a scene of Jameson reporting on the incident at the Statue of Liberty, following up by saying that if Spider-Man were a real hero, he'd unmask so the world could know who he is. This was a really nice, subtle way of easing us into this new paradigm. Peter goes to the cafe where MJ works, and sees her and Ned. He orders a coffee, but it dawns on him how difficult it will be to tell these two total strangers that they were once his best friend and the love of his life without sounding like a crazy person. This scene is absolutely gutting, and might I also say beautifully shot. He then introduces himself to Happy Hogan at Aunt May's grave, and tells Happy that Aunt May knew him through Spider-Man. The film ends with Peter rocking up to his new apartment with his GED manual and an empty photo frame his only remnant of his old life being the Lego minifigure of Emperor Palpatine. He suits up in his homemade recreation of the classic red and blue Spider-Man costume, no black stripes, no redesigning here, just pure classic Spider-Man, and he swings off into the winter snow. For the mid-credits, we have Venom, now in the MCU, discussing previous events in the MCU at a bar, before deciding he wants to go and meet Spider-Man himself, Ooh, how exciting, before phasing back to his home dimension. I'll talk a bit more about that when we get to the spin-offs, but for now, let me just say, this is the worst mid-credits I've ever seen in my entire life. It's garbage. They brought Venom into the MCU just to send him back immediately with absolutely no interaction with Spider-Man. Who did you think wanted that? That feels like a joke at the audience's expense. It just sucks. And in the post-credits, there's a trailer for Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness, so not much to really talk about there. So that is Spider-Man No Way Home, and what a crazy film this is. I gotta start with the negative. This is easily the most sloppily constructed Spider-Man film since The Amazing Spider-Man 2. I am not, never have been, never will be a stickler for plot holes, but some of this stuff is just egregious. Norman Osborn's Green Goblin being public knowledge is just, how does that happen? How do you mess that up? As I say, it fortunately doesn't have a great deal of bearing on the story, you could slice that out and the film wouldn't really change much. So no, it doesn't by any means ruin the film for me, but it took me out of the moment. It's just egregious. 
Electro shouldn't be here. I liked Electro a lot in this film. I much prefer this version of the character, from Jamie Foxx's portrayal to his design taking cues from the classic 616 Electro, even down to his mask being briefly hinted at. This is a great version of Electro, and I'm glad he's here. It does mean we at least got a really great cinematic version of Electro. But it does just make no sense that he's here. He never found out Peter Parker was Spider-Man, nor does he even hint at the possibility that he knew. In fact, he doubles down by saying he thought Spider-Man would be black making a little nod to Spider-Man Miles Morales, so he clearly didn't know who Peter Parker was. It's for the best that this is almost completely unrecognizable to his Amazing 2 depiction, but I feel like they could have done something to suggest that he knew Peter Parker was Spider-Man, even if it was just one line of dialogue, like maybe before he died while he was absorbing data from the power grid he had this divine realization or something. Even that's a stretch though, it's a very hard plot hole to patch up even with headcanon. Some have pointed out that during the power plant fight of Amazing 2, Gwen does refer to Spider-Man as Peter a few times, but A, does Electro have super hearing? Not outside of the realm of possibility, but he didn't know who Peter Parker was anyway. So just hearing the name Peter isn't gonna tell him anything. As mentioned before, why does Doctor Strange not discuss the implications of the first spell with Peter? How did Peter know he'd be able to get Strange out of the mirror dimension? Ned being able to open portals with a sling ring was a massive revelation. It's not like he'd tried before that point. Why doesn't Otto have any reaction to Dr. Connors, a good friend of his in his own universe, being a lizard man? Again, I'm not a stickler for plot holes, but there's just so many of them here, and they're just too big to ignore. Again, did the writers watch the previous film before writing this script? Because it doesn't feel like it. It feels like a Wikipedia level of knowledge was applied to this. Objectively speaking, this film has some major issues. The construction of this one is absurdly sloppy. There are some instances, though, where I gotta admit, I did reflect on the previous films differently because of this one. So, this was another thing that I did find egregious on first time viewing. So Peter is curing the villains for their survival's sake, but the point Doc Ock was extracted from was the point at the end of the final battle of Spider-Man 2. Ock knows Peter is Spider-Man. He has him by the throat. The reactor can't be stopped. So if he cures him or not, Ock's just gonna die regardless, right? Well, not necessarily. See, Ock refused Spider-Man's help with downing the reactor in Spider-Man 2. Now, the other thing you could say is that MCU Peter doesn't know that Ock would just immediately die, but be that as it may, there is logical writing and then there's satisfying writing. If it's logical but unsatisfying, that doesn't make it any better in my eyes. Let's refer back to his last words, though. I will not die a monster. He had a fleeting moment of clarity and he chose that moment to die. He chose to sacrifice himself in that instance, as opposed to accepting Spidey's help. So maybe when he goes back this time, he and Spidey will work together to down the reactor. But we don't see any of that. I understand this is focused on being Tom's movie, so they don't want to show the other universes. They keep it contained to just MCU Spidey's world, but it would be a far more complete movie if we saw a little bit of what these villains would go on to do next but I'm hoping that this creates divergent timelines as opposed to actually impacting the original movies. Because if you don't kill Norman in Spider-Man 1, the entire conflict between Peter and Harry can't happen. And that was central to the Raimi trilogy. So I like to think that the original trilogy remains intact, but now we've got a divergent timeline. And I suppose there is some evidence to suggest that based on how time travel worked in Avengers Endgame. Also this here, this right here is the worst thing I have ever seen in my entire life. And I know for certain that Avi Arad wrote this himself, because there's no filmmaker in the world that would unironically want to thank Avi Arad for anything. Also, original True Believer, put some respect on Stan Lee's name. So, okay, that's the most egregious stuff there. I am personally of the opinion that Spider-Man No Way Home is a very sloppily constructed movie with a foundational understanding, if even that, of the stories that it's referencing. The balance of comedy and drama is also a little awkward in spots too. That weird conversation about how Electro hates the woods, Lizard doubting that MJ is really Peter's girlfriend, the weird scene where Ned tries to call for Peter but all three Peters respond, and it's this big farcical misunderstanding. You can see where these moments have just been cut in. There's also the gratuitous references as well, the I am something of a scientist myself coming back, the scene where Toby says he's got a bad back, it just feels like SNL skits intercut with THE movie. 
I can understand why people would enjoy these though, I just think they'd be better placed in Blu-ray menus rather than the film itself. With the most negative part of what I have to say about this film kind of out of the way though, let's kind of go for the stuff that I'm a bit more middle of the road about. I'm kind of hoping that this won't be the last time we see Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield's Spider-Man, even though I would say that's probably pretty likely. I'll say this much, it's a satisfying send-off for them, but I definitely don't feel like we got the most out of bringing these characters back. If the whole thing with this movie was everyone knows Peter Parker is Spider-Man converging with the MCU, then where's Mary Jane? Wouldn't it be a funny twist if Sally Field and Rosemary Harris's Aunt May showed up? Considering how wink wink nudge nudge they were about Spider-Man's secret identity, it would be funny to finally actually answer that. We never get to see any like close-up shot of the three Spideys together, not even in daylight. We only get a brief moment of the three swinging together. And when it comes to Tobey Maguire with the mask on, we really only get fleeting glimpses. You never underestimate the importance of the mask. That thing is the defining symbol of all Spider-Men, more so than the actors who wear it. Speaking of which, God, did the design team just not have any reference pics of Tobey's mask? What happened here? The Tobey Maguire Spider-Man mask is beautiful, and I was really looking forward to seeing it again. But this is just... I mean, okay, it's a nitpick, but it, it doesn't look right. Where's the mean-looking gunmetal eyes? Why is the webbing so uneven? Again, it's a nitpick. It holds no bearing on my enjoyment of the film. It's by no means objective. But damn it, it's a missed opportunity. It's something I'm clearly very sentimental about. There's only one Spider-Man mask that I own a replica of, and it's this one. And boy, does it bring me so much joy to see it done right. I think the key thing to keep in mind is that this is still not a Spider-Verse movie. It prioritizes being Spider-Man No Way Home, being Tom Holland's movie, and it focuses on that, and I'd say it's for the better as I'd hate to see Tom Holland's trilogy getting hijacked. With that being said, when I initially thought, oh, live-action Spider-Verse, Tobey Maguire, Andrew Garfield, I, I thought they'd be facing off against, like, Morlin or something, so to see them bringing back their villains from those movies is a massive bonus. That is something I never took for granted, and I'm thrilled to bits that this is the direction they took. Having Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield play supporting roles in Tom's sequel, it's a tasteful way of doing it, but I really hope that we can get a devoted Spider-Verse film so that we can maximize the potential of this concept. If nothing else, just get a nice poster with all three Spider-Men on it. Yeah, okay, we got this, but eh. What's with the weird lack of photos of the Spider-Men with their masks on? You, you get all three Spider-Men together and you never think to take some of them with the masks on? I'm not saying less of them without the masks, I'm saying more of them with the masks. Just do more. More photos. Get me more photos of Spider-Man! Put it this way though, this movie sold like gangbusters and both Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield are willing to return, so I'd say it's well within the realm of possibility. Seriously, zero interaction between Green Goblin and Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man? Are you serious? Also right, the spell makes people forget, but does it erase all records of Peter's secret identity? Could someone not just dig up the old video of Mysterio revealing the secret? Well, there are hints that there is no evidence left behind. The empty photo frame, the GED manual as a replacement for lost qualifications, but if you don't know how a GED manual works, which I sure as hell didn't, there isn't really sufficient evidence to indicate that Spidey's secret identity is entirely wiped from existence. Alright, but with all that being said, it probably sounds like I hate this movie, which I don't. I actually love this movie. Let's talk about what Spider-Man No Way Home does right. For one, Spider-Man. This is a quintessential Spider-Man story. This Peter Parker wants to recover his secret identity not for himself, but because he's taking responsibility for Ned and MJ not getting into MIT. I'm so glad they didn't just gloss over the identity reveal. This feels like a proper, organic follow-up to Spider-Man Far From Home. I appreciate that the returning characters weren't just gratuitous cameos, or they're purely for fan service. They actually play an integral role. If you remove the Spider-Verse fanservice-y aspects of this film, you have a completely different film, and I think that's how it should be. These aspects, these characters, should be integral, and they justify their appearance as well. The interactions between the villains are a lot of fun too. It's nice to see how they interact with one another in a way that we've never seen before. We've never seen Green Goblin and Doc Ock meet, and now we have that. The three Spider-Men have excellent chemistry. The ending is absolutely heartbreaking. 
Having the resolution be that the world forgets who Peter Parker is means that he gets his identity back, but it comes at a huge cost. Aunt May's death scene is incredibly powerful. The action beats are great. This is the best soundtrack, the best score that any MCU Spider-Man film has had to date. Michael Giacchino fires on all cylinders. I love the more choiral, sort of operatic sound that he's given to the Spider-Man theme this time around. It feels fully fleshed out. There's a new responsibility theme that weaves in with the main theme really well. I do wish we'd heard more of Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield's themes. We hear a tiny little bit of them, mainly the responsibility theme in the case of Tobey Maguire, but it's, just, it's a shame we never got to hear that Danny Elfman overture again in what could be Tobey Maguire's final appearance as Spider-Man. The nods are used sparingly, and I kind of appreciate that, but at the same time, I do lament the missed opportunities. Spider-Man No Way Home released when the tide was starting to turn on the pandemic. And whether or not it holds up under scrutiny, this was a very important film. It was the first film of the pandemic era to cross the $1 billion mark at the box office. And no matter how good it is as a Spider-Man movie or as a movie, it's quite obvious to see why. This was the perfect film for the pandemic era. I could not think of a better film to release during this time. It was exactly what everybody needed. Obviously, during the pandemic, while people were under lockdowns and some people were losing loved ones, it stood to reason that people would be reflecting on the past. Happier times, less complicated times, when people had a bit more control over their lives, and in some cases, when people had more of their loved ones around. And sure, you could say, you know, any nostalgia movie will do that, but I don't think any film has done the nostalgia thing, bringing back legacy actors, as well as Spider-Man No Way Home has done. It's a film that takes us back to happier and simpler times. It reunites us with old friends, and they're all just as great as they were the last time we saw them. And I think the sense of isolation that Spider-Man feels by the end of the film is something a lot of people will be able to relate to after all the different lockdowns and restrictions were put into place because of the pandemic. I'm not sure if the story took the shape that it did because of the pandemic, but this was definitely the ideal movie for it. As for how the pandemic affected the film, you can kind of see that, yeah, this Spider-Man film feels a little bit different to previous ones. It's a very indoors Spider-Man film. It's all in very enclosed sort of studio backlot kind of environments. The majority of the film taking place in the Undercroft and Happy Hogan's apartment. And generally, shots will have around about one or two people on screen at a time. So I'll say that with it, it is a bit more of a claustrophobic feeling Spider-Man film, I guess. I believe the majority of this film was shot against a blue screen. And yeah, that does make a lot of sense for the pandemic era. But with that being said, the special effects are not too shabby for the most part. There are a few ropey moments here and there, but generally, for the most part, it's fine. I think going for something a lot more character-driven this time, a bit more intimate than previous Spider-Man films, was a good call, especially for, you know, the pandemic era of filmmaking. And yeah, what was going to get butts on seats more than having Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield reprise their roles as Spider-Man alongside Tom Holland? So yeah, the film was a huge success. With everything Spider-Man No Way Home sets out to do on a fundamental level, you'd have to screw this up a lot to make this anything less than a great time at the movies. What this film does on a fundamental level is, yes, it follows up Spider-Man Far From Home really well, but it also brings 20 years of Spider-Man cinematic history together and treats it all as valid. Just because Raimi and Webb's versions of Spider-Man were ultimately rebooted, it doesn't make them any less important. It doesn't make them any less valid. And what makes these guys different to one another is what makes them Spider-Man. The fact that Tom Holland's Spider-Man was so sparing on the origin story and Uncle Ben references only for Aunt May to serve that purpose in this one it only makes Tom Holland's Spider-Man more distinctive when standing shoulder to shoulder with the other two Spideys. There are no reboots, it's all one series, and I adore that. I'm so thankful that this new MCU Spider-Man trilogy didn't leave the Raimi and Webb depictions behind. Each villain, each Spider-Man, gets a satisfying amount of time devoted to them. Doctor Strange is well utilized, the character dynamics are excellent, the themes of responsibility and sacrifice are all handled wonderfully. What Spider-Man No Way Home gets right is so good, and that's the lion's share of this film. As I said earlier, the plot holes such as Norman being public knowledge don't really have any bearing on this film here. 
It's a character interaction that calls past continuity into question, but you could just as easily have them not know this, and the story would still play out the exact same. The construction of this film is sloppy, but the content is fantastic. At the end of the day, whatever issues there are with this movie, it doesn't take away from the joy of experiencing this in theaters. Hearing the crowd roar as the Green Goblin appeared for the first time in this film, the sheer glee that swept the entire theatre audience when Andrew Garfield rocked up, the cooing and anticipation of Toby's appearance followed by the sheer elation of his reveal, the cheers when Andrew Garfield's Spider-Man rescued MJ, even the cheers for Matt Murdock. Again, I'm European, I live in Britain, we don't cheer in cinemas, we're a miserable people. But the crowd was going absolutely wild for this film, and I will never forget or underestimate the fun we had with this movie. And I still get that same sense of excitement watching this film back, no matter how many times. It's a testament to what this film does, what it achieves, to the point that I can forgive the issues this film has, but as a guy who talks about this stuff on YouTube, I do have to acknowledge that there are some more objective issues that do work against this film but they ultimately don't affect my enjoyment of it. My subjective experience with Spider-Man No Way Home is absolutely wonderful, but that, if anything, makes Spider-Man No Way Home a very difficult film to discuss. It's a great film in my opinion. I can forgive its shortcomings because I think what this film does well more than makes up for that, but I definitely hope that future MCU Spider-Man films will improve on the writing of this one because this script was absolutely scuffed. So there is an extended cut of this film. We did get a cinematic re-release a few months later dubbed the more fun stuff version, and yeah, it does what it says on the tin. It's Spider-Man No Way Home, but there's a bit more fun stuff. Now let's be real, I guess we shouldn't have expected anything mind-blowing from this. If there were any scenes that would elevate this movie to being even better, then they would have just left them in the original cut. What we have here feels more like the deleted scenes that you'd find on a Blu-ray menu just placed back into the film. This one is strictly for fans, as a lot of these new additions are purely just more funnies that will make you XD and ruffle. The interrogations are extended with a running gag about Spider-Man hating public landmarks from both Jameson and Damage Control. These were fine. We got some additional scenes at Midtown High as Betty Brown interview students, teachers, and of course, Peter. We get a little follow-up on Ned and Betty's relationship from Far From Home, but this whole thing does stop the movie dead for a solid few minutes, just for a few extra hyucks. I did like when the students were pitching their ideas for the redesigned Statue of Liberty, and one of the designs was Mysterio replacing the Statue of Liberty, and I'm wondering if that's a reference to Spider-Man 2 the game, or if it's deliberate. There's a bit more of Matt Murdock, including him representing Happy Hogan, which I liked well enough. Some alternate scenes in the Undercroft as we get a different montage set to Monster Mash, and we get a bit of extended interaction between the three Peters before the final battle as they chat the Statue of Liberty. As a fan of these three, yeah, it's great, but as a fan of movies, again, it grinds the entire film to a halt for the sake of more meta humor. There's already an imbalance of comedy in most MCU films, and I'd say there's an imbalance of comedy in Spider-Man No Way Home, but this just doubles down on that. These scenes really just belong in a special features menu, and it's a shame that there's no physical release for this cut of the film, and that you can only rent or buy it on streaming. It's not included on any physical media, so if you've already bought that, you can go fuck yourself. Buy it again. This is just a cash grab, but I do at least think that the removal of these scenes from the theatrical release did at least feel more like deleted scenes, rather than just parts of the film being sliced off and sold piecemeal, like what we had with Spider-Man Far From Home's extended cut. If there's one scene that definitely should have stayed in though, it's the after credits, which is a graduation video for Midtown High made by Betty Brunt, as the students reflect on their time at Midtown, and Peter Parker is nowhere to be seen. Not only is this a really nice send-off for the supporting cast, it's also sufficient evidence that all records of Peter Parker are now wiped. So question, how has he not been deported? Okay, well, I'm willing to exercise suspension of disbelief there. I'm not, I'm not completely unwilling to do that. On a whole, in a toss-up, I'll go for the theatrical cut every time. But I do think the ideal version of No Way Home is the theatrical cut, but with the new after credits. So on a whole, Spider-Man No Way Home is flawed in many ways, but it's a celebration of Spider-Man's history on the big screen, all while being a third MCU Spider-Man film. 
and it's surprising just how well that flows. It doesn't just feel purely like nostalgia pandering, it still manages to feel like an organic follow-up to Spider-Man Far From Home, but with the returning cast as supporting characters. I can overlook its shortcomings and plot holes, but I do think they should be acknowledged, as while I may be able to overlook that with a celebration of Spidey's history for as meta as it is, I wouldn't be able to overlook that standard of writing if applied to a Spider-Man film that isn't giving closure to legacy versions of these characters. The fundamental basis that Spider-Man is revisiting his history on the big screen and righting the wrongs, it's a very Spidey story, it's a celebration and I love that. Heck, even taking cues from One More Day and making it work with the end of Peter and MJ's relationship, it's all executed so well. This is a film that makes peace with the darker moments in Spidey's history, and I can only commend that. It isn't what I'd consider to be the best Spider-Man movie, and I wouldn't say it's even close to the quality of Spider-Man 2 or Into the Spider-Verse, but I'm there for the celebration. And it's safe to say that of all of the films that tug at those nostalgia strings from the past decade, this one feels the most meaningful. And that brings us to the end of the Spider-Man movie retrospective, at least for now. And what have we learned here? There are so many different ways of approaching the character of Spider-Man, so many twists, so many ways you can adjust the narrative while adhering to the core aspects of the character. I don't think we've ever veered too far from that, even with projects that I'm not so fond of like Spider-Man Turn Off the Dark or The Amazing Spider-Man 2. I think every one of these films has at least a few ideas, a few themes to take away from it that'll stick with you in ways that I just don't see from a lot of other superhero movies. I think that's the power of Spider-Man, how he inspires, how Peter Parker or Miles Morales, they relate to us so that Spider-Man can inspire us. It's true, what makes each of these depictions different is what makes them Spider-Man, so long as the fundamental always rings true. Anyone can wear the mask. As long as they never lose sight of that, there are no bad Spider-Man movies. So what happens next? Well, Across the Spider-Verse is on the way, and I cannot wait. But you don't simply do a retrospective days or weeks or even months after a film's release. A retrospective is all about letting our feelings, our thoughts, our assessments marinate. So I don't think you'll be seeing a retrospective on Across the Spider-Verse from me for a good year or so. But that doesn't mean I won't review it once it's out. I'd never miss out on the chance to do that. So for now, consider this the end of the first wave of the Spider-Man retrospectives. But for as long as they are still making Spider-Man movies, I'll still be thinking about them year after year and bringing you these videos. Now, if you'll just stick with me for a little longer, there will be a bonus episode focusing on the Sony Spider-Man spin-offs. That's Venom, Venom Let There Be Carnage, and Morbius. I'll be covering them all in one video, but you can consider that the epilogue to this year's Spidey Movie Adventure. So I'll see you there, true believers. Guys, what do you think of Spider-Man No Way Home? What have you thought of this retrospective? My video, comment below, discuss. As always, if you enjoyed this video and you want to see more like it, be sure to hit subscribe, hit the like button. The response to this retrospective has been, like, my, my heart is full, let's just put it that way. I'm really glad that people took to this in the end. We'll definitely be doing things like Spider-Man shows in the future as well for retrospective, so there's more to come. All that's left to do now is to thank the patrons. If you want your name in the credits of my videos, as well as unlockable bonus content, you can do so for as little as a dollar a month. And now a special shout out to the patrons in the $10 or above tiers. You ought to know their names, so here we go. Dear Denny, Kale Bennett, La Giotto, Ken K, Legendary Ray Ray, Dr. SP with your PSA for the week, Americans, act responsibly over the three day weekend, everyone else, just Monday, Sergio, Source Skeptic. I love the Boss Baby movies. I'm their biggest fan. And for those in the $5 tier, we've got Broski, SSS06, Dazzle Fizzle, and Council of Geeks. Thank you so much for your generosity, and as for the rest of you, thank you so much for watching, guys, and have a great day.